I'm still waiting for people to join everyone. So we'll start in a few minutes and looking at who's on and just want to wait until we get a, get a quorum. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I guess I guess we can get started. There's still maybe a few joining, but we, I think we have we have a quorum now, so I think I'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Armitage from the EPA Science Advisory Board Office, and I'm the designated federal officer for the Chartered EPA Science Advisory Board. And I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Chartered SAB. It's a continuation of the meeting that we began on Monday, July 18th. I want to note that this is a public meeting of the SAB, and I want to let everyone know that we have provided members of the public access to the meeting through a teleconference line and through a live, a live webcast, and that all the meeting materials are available on the SAB website. So before I turn the meeting over to Dr. Allison Cullen, chair of SAB, I'm just going to take roll to record the members present so please uh, indicate whether you're here when I call your name. Dr. Allison Cullen. Here. Dr. Marjorie Aileon. Present. Dr. David Allen. Dr. Susan Annenberg. Dr. Florence Anuro. Dr. Joe Arbai. Dr. Barbara Beck. Dr. Roland Benke. Present. Dr. Tammy Bond. Present. Dr. Mark Borsak. Present. Dr. Sylvie Bruder. Present. Dr. Jay Chakraborty. Present. Dr. Amin Chen. Present. Dr. Amy Childress. Dr. Wei Sui Chu. Here. Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Present. Mr. Earl Fordham. Dr. John Guckenheimer. Present. Dr. Steve Hamburg. Dr. Marcus Hendricks. 
Dr. Celine Hernandez Ruiz. I thought I saw her on, but I think she's on. Uh, Dr. Alina Irwin. Present. Dr. David Kaiser. Present. Dr. Mark Le Chevalier. Present. Dr. Angela Lung. Present. Ms. Lisa Lonefight. Dr. Lala Ma. Present. Dr. John Morris. Here. Dr. Enid Neptune. Dr. Sheila Olmsted. Dr. Austin Omer. Dr. Gloria Post. Present. Dr. Christy Pullen Fednick. Dr. Amanda Rodewald. Present. Dr. Emma Rosie. Present. Dr. Jonathan Samet. Present. Dr. Leanne Shepard. Present. Dr. Drew Schindel. Dr. Janice Smith. Dr. Richard Smith. Dr. Daniel Stram. Present. Dr. Peter Thorne. Present. Dr. Godfrey Uzochakwu. Present. Dr. Wei Sung Wang. Dr. June Weintraub. Present. Dr. Sakobi Wilson. Dr. Dominic van der Mensbrug. Present. And the board liaisons, Dr. Daniel Schlenk from the Tosca SAC. And the new chair of the Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, Dr. Shirley Tan. Here. Dr. Robert Chapin from the FIFRA SAP. And Dr. Paul Gilman from the Board of Scientific Counselors. Here. Thank you. And I will note that although everyone on the board is not present, we do have a quorum for today's meeting. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cullen to begin. Thank you very much, Tom. And good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I see a hand, it's Celine hernandez Reese. Present, uh, yes. I presume. Uh, present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second day of this meeting of the Chartered EPA Science Advisory Board. We had a meeting earlier in the week on Monday, July 18th. We have two items on the agenda for today's meeting. We're going to receive a briefing from the EPA on drinking water health advisories for PFAS. And we'll conduct a quality review of the SAB draft report titled Review of EPA's Analyses to Support EPA's National Primary Drinking Water Rulemaking for PFAS. I want to note that we heard public comments on July 18th, and today there'll be an opportunity near the end of the meeting to hear additional brief clarifying public comments. The purpose of this short second public comment period is to hear brief approximately two minute uh, comments from members of the public concerning points raised at the meeting. So these are responses. Members of the public who wish to provide these short clarifying comments should send an email to the designated federal officer, Tom Armitage, before the scheduled break, and his email address is on the SAB meeting website. Are there any questions from SAB members before we begin? And I see one hand up, someone who's on an iPhone, so I can't see what your name is. Go ahead. This is Lisa Lonefight. I'm also present. I just had trouble with my mute. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions or people who are connecting now are able to? I'm honored to be here on this historic day. I have no um, questions. Okay, thanks. forgive me. All right, let's proceed with our agenda then. So our first item uh, on the agenda today is a briefing from EPA's Office of Water 
on drinking water health advisories for PFAS chemicals. The EPA speakers from Office of Water will be Ms. Elizabeth Bill, who's the Director of the Health and Ecological Criteria Division in the Office of Science and Technology, and Mr. Eric Bernison, Director of the Standards and Risk Management Division in EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. I would call on the EPA speakers to go ahead and begin their presentation and we'll advance the slides for you. So just call for the next slide when you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Culler. Uh, again, my name is Eric Bernison and I'm the Director of the Standards and Risk Management Division. I'll be joined by Betsy Beal, who's actually having some uh, difficulties. So she'll be, I think she's connected by phone. Uh, we're gonna go through the slides that have just been loaded up. Um, but I, before we get started, I wanna thank you, Dr. Cullen and the members of the Science Advisory Board for your work. Uh, uh, your review, your quality review today of the uh, evaluations of the, the documents we're going to be talking about, as well as for your work on Monday to evaluate the CCL5. These are critical actions that EPA is taking under the Safe Drinking Water Act to both identify and prioritize contaminants for consideration in the Safe Drinking Water Act, and as we'll be talking about uh, in a little bit, to uh, actually develop national primary drinking water regulations. Um, so I also want to thank Dr. Chu for the, the work of the, the PFAS committee. And, and last but not least, I want to thank the SAB staff office for their facilitation of your review, as well as for them uh, working with us to provide us an opportunity to talk to you today about some recent actions that we've taken uh, and some upcoming actions we're taking to address PFAS and drinking water. With that, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, I just want to remind everybody of the request that we made to the SAB. Uh, then I think we want to spend some time talking about the recent health advisories. I know that there was some discussion both amongst uh, the members of the SAB as well as in the public comments about those health advisories. We want to provide some clarification about what, what those actions were. Uh, and then and most importantly, we want to talk about next steps. Uh, uh, we're getting a little bit of a feedback on that. So uh, hopefully we can um, get everybody to mute themselves. Um, so let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, so just to remind everybody back in November was when of uh, last year was when the agency transmitted to the Science Advisory Board uh, four documents that we asked for your review of the, fir the first two being proposed approaches to develop the maximum contaminant level goals uh, for both PFOA and PFOS. Uh, these, these are uh, scient the scientific documents that will underlie our health effects analysis uh, that will uh, drive the, the non-enforceable health-based goal for the drinking water regulation. We also uh, asked the SAB for review and input on uh, estimating non-cancer health risks associated with mixtures of peripheral alcohol substances, recognizing the fact that many PFAS actually are found in mixtures in drinking water. We were seeking input on ways that we could assess the risks from those mis mixtures. Uh, and last but not least, we asked for a SAB review of an analysis of cardiovascular disease risk reduction, which may result from reductions in P PFOA and PFOS exposure uh, also related to the rulemaking and the health risk reduction cost and benefits analysis that we must do. So it's we are seeking um, the SAB's review on these documents. We had a number of charge questions that we posed uh, to you and we're looking forward to receiving your input. We've obviously already uh, read with great interest uh, the input that the, the committee, the PFAS committee has provided, but we recognize the importance of, of the quality review that the science advisory board is, is, is conducting. And, and with that, I want to be clear um, that we will be considering the SAB's input as we develop the proposed uh, PFAS National Primary Drinking Water Regulation, including um, the derivation of the maximum contaminant level goal, which the agency has not yet proposed. I want to be clear, we have not yet proposed an MCLG uh, uh, or for P4 or PFAS. Uh, we have issued health advisories, and I want to turn the presentation over to Betsy Beal, and she'll talk to you about uh, about those health advisories. So, Betsy, I see you've you've been able to connect, and you've got video up again. So, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, my video, video is up. Video is up. Video is up. Video is up. Oh goodness. Uh, and I don't know if you can hear me. 
we can hear you now. There is a bit of feedback. Try again. How Try about again. now? Can, can yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, we Let's still try have this. some Let's feedback. Try okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that was much better. Thank you. Oh, goodness. I can't hear you at all. Oh. Um, we can hear you. So, Eric, perhaps you can do this presentation. I, I can't connect. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, while Betsy's uh, going through, through some technical difficulties, I'm gonna- Okay, somebody said that I sound fine. If that's the case, give me a thumbs up because I can't hear you and I will keep going, very good. Okay, so everybody, we're very happy to be here um, and, and speak with you uh, this morning about the health advisories. On uh, June 15th of 2022, EPA issued health advisories for four perfluorinated chemicals. Um, they included health advisories for Gen X and uh, PFBS. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? There we go. Uh, for Gen X and uh, PFBS and interim uh, health advisories for PFOA and PFOS, which we understand fully are under, uh, the science is under review by the SAB right now. The reason that we issued uh, these uh, health advisories including the interims, uh, is a pressing need to replace the 2016 health advisories of 70 parts per billion based on our analysis of the most recent health effects showing that uh, these two chemicals can impact human health at much lower levels than the 70 part per billion levels uh, in the uh, 2016 health advisory levels, uh, health advisories. Um, we based those um, uh, interim updated health advisories on um, drafts that were uh, are undergoing SAB review, specifically on the draft uh, assessments that were issued in November of 2021. Um, and uh, the health advisories themselves uh, are um, aimed at providing information to health officials while the regulatory process is ongoing. We fully recognize that the toxicity values will change as a result of the work that we've been doing since we first heard from you in, in December and in January and then in the draft recommendations uh, earlier this year um, to, on, on issues that you uh, wanted us to address. And um, that work is, is ongoing. But uh, we believe uh, based on our the work that we've, uh, rework that we've done to date, that the health advisories are likely to remain below the PFO and PFAS minimum reporting levels of four parts per trillion. That's a level associated with um, the uh, 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 maximum quantitation level in the unregulated contaminated monitoring rule number five monitoring. Um, so that's where that comes from. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Um, just a reminder about what health advisories uh, are. Uh, drinking water health advisories provide information on contaminants that can cause health effects and are known or anticipated to incur in drinking water. Very importantly, these health advisories are non-enforceable and they are non-regulatory. And I want to emphasize again that the PFOA and PFAS uh, health advisories are interim health advisories. Uh, the health advisory documents themselves also include information on analytical methods and treatment. A health advisory level is the concentration of a drinking water contaminant over a specific exposure duration at or below which exposure is not anticipated to lead to adverse human health effects. The PFO and PFAS uh, and the Gen X and PFBS uh, health advisories are lifetime health advisories and they are designed to protect all Americans including sensitive populations and life stages from adverse effects resulting from exposure throughout their lives. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the four drinking water health advisories. Um, the two advisories for PFOA and PFAS that are interim are, are on, in green on, uh, in the table shown on this slide. Uh, and uh, the health advisory levels are 0 0.004 parts per trillion and 0 0.02 parts per trillion, um, respectively. 
uh, you can see that these uh, values are well below uh, the minimum reporting limit of um, level of uh, four parts per trillion that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, the uh, Gen X and PFBS um, health advisories, which are listed as final here, but that's just mostly to distinguish them uh, from the interim health advisories uh, for the other two chemicals, uh, are um, uh, above the minimum reporting levels and therefore will be able to, uh, to be detected at the levels of the health advisory. Um, because the um, levels of uh, PFO and PFAS are below the um, uh, uh, method, uh, the minimum reporting level, EPA recommends that if water systems detect PFO and PFAS, that they take steps such as informing residents, undertaking monitoring, and examining steps to limit exposure uh, where uh, these compounds are detected in, in finished drinking water. May I have the next slide, please? So um, this slide shows you uh, a, a, a few of the many uh, materials that EPA also published on June, June uh, 15th, um, associated with the release of the health advisories. Um, there are drinking, the drinking water health advisory documents and supporting science documents. Uh, we issued questions and answers, a number of different fact sheets, one for communities, another for public water supply systems, a technical fact sheet that goes into greater detail on how the health advisories were developed. And this, uh, at this uh, location on the web, you can find the full suite of health advisory materials that EPA released. May I have the next slide, please? Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Betsy. Um, so uh, I, I wanna highlight here that our next steps moving forward uh, are consistent with EPA's commitments under the PFAS strategic roadmap. So we are developing a national pr uh, primary drinking water regulation for PFOL and PFOS. Um, I would also note that we are uh, evaluating additional PFAS chemicals and considering groups of other uh, PFAS uh, as of course supported by the best available science. I wanna emphasize yet again that we do plan and are anticipating the input from the Science Advisory Board. Uh, we'll be considering that input uh, as we develop the proposed maximum contaminant level goals and the MCLGs uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act. These are the non-enforceable health-based goals that set in former standard setting process. The Safe Drinking Water Act requires we set them at the level at which there are no adverse effects with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act also requires that we consult the SAB, which is why we've come to you seeking your input on these, uh, these and other documents related to the development of the drinking water standard. Um, I want to emphasize that the, the health-based MCLG is, as I said, not enforceable, and that the enforceable standard that we set in the Safe Drinking Water Act, which, is either a, which will either be maximum contaminant levels or a treatment technique, that is set as close as feasible to the MCLGs. Uh, but we do take into account factors such as our ability to measure uh, the ability of water, the availability of treatment technologies that have been demonstrated in the field uh, to, re to reduce the contaminant, as well as a, a robust consideration of the costs and benefits um, as we evaluate and establish uh, uh, or propose a national primary drinking water regulation. Uh, we intend to propose the, the, the PFAS regulation this fall. Um, and then we will obviously consider public input on that proposed rule and then uh, it, promulgate a final rule in the fall of 2023. So that's a proposal this fall uh, with a final rule uh, a year later in the fall of 2023. Uh, so again, I wanna thank uh, the Science Advisory Board for taking uh, a uh, careful and close look at the information that we have presented, and we, we very much value the input that you're providing. And Dr. Cullen, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to see if there are any clarifying questions for us. Thanks so much, Eric, and also um, Elizabeth. Are there questions from the board this time? Yes, I have a question though. Thank you, go ahead. Yeah, my question is this analysis done by 
uh, presented by EPA? Are they performed in EPA labs or are there other labs that contribute data? I'll, I'll answer that question, assuming that we're talking about analysis of drinking water samples. I think that's the nature of the analysis that you're asking about. Um, and so EPA, uh, uh, what we have is a laboratory uh, approval programs. I'll answer this in the context of the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, in which, which is a monitoring program that EPA has established for purposes of regulating uh, 29 PFAS plus uh, lithium. So EPA has a, a, a laboratory approval program. Uh, we've approved a number of labs to do monitoring for the UCMR5 program. One of, the, one of the pieces of information that we've presented on our website associated with those health advisories is a link to the laboratories that have been approved uh, by EPA for purposes of monitoring under the UCMR5. I would also note that many of our state co-regulators also have PFAS monitoring programs. In those cases, uh, those states will be establishing uh, quality assurance requirements and laboratory approval uh, requirements for those labs. Uh, but to specifically answer your question, the majority of the analysis that's done for PFAS in drinking water is not done by EPA labs. It's done by the laboratories that um, either EPA contracts and works with or that the water systems themselves work with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guggenheimer, you're up, and then Dr. Le Chevalier, and then uh, Dr. Hernandez-Ruiz. Yeah, excuse me, but I've been having laryngitis and may not be very readily understandable. We, we can uh, hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, it seems to me that there's unusually high uncertainty in almost all of the results about PFAS and PFAS, and I was wondering if you can comment on that in the way in which you're going about establishing the uh, contaminant coal levels? Well, uh, this, is, this is Betsy. I'm uh, taking over somebody else's computer so you, you can hopefully hear me and see me. Um, we have uh, reviewed uh, all of the available public literature and um, using uh, systematic review processes and have um, characterized uh, the quality of all of the studies that we're uh, including in our analyses. And we're using uh, multiple uh, lines of evidence, including animal and, and um, human data to come to our conclusions. Uh, I wouldn't say um, that there is un unusually high uncertainty uh, associated with this assessment. Uh, and we've tried to be as transparent as possible about the quality of information that we have included. Dr. Guggenheimer, any follow-up or are you? No, I'm fine. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Le Chevalier. Yes, uh, Betsy, Eric, thanks for the, uh, the explanation, uh, but I'm still a little unclear. You say that these interim health advisories will likely change um, based on SAB review. Will you go back and, and reissue, health, revise health advisories? Or is, are you intending that these reviews uh, influence your, the um, uh, proposed M MCLGs and MCLs uh, when, when they are proposed this fall? And, um, and if, if the health advisories are, are likely to change, then my question is, why issue them just a few months, and wh why not wait for the for the review to have um, a, a final? Is this going to con uh, cause confusion in the public with changing numbers and and ultimately mistrust in the process? Great. Well, thank you so much for that question. It's a really good question, and I think a lot of people uh, have the same question. So. Um, we, we issued um, the interim health advisories because the analyses that we did showed that the, the 70 part per billion um, final health advisories for both PFO and PFAS are orders of magnitude higher than, than what we were finding. And we know, that, we know that these numbers will change. We got a lot of great recommendations from the SAB and we've been working very, very, very hard 
uh, to follow up on those recommendations. We've uh, added uh, uh, additional uh, studies uh, to uh, our uh, review, uh, done an additional uh, uh, literature review, adding in new, new data. Um, we have followed up on recommendations to look at other endpoints and other models. Uh, and uh, have been working feverishly since January. Um, however, uh, the, the uh, work that we've done, um, which was largely supported the major conclusions um, in the draft recommendations from the SAB shows us that, that um, the numbers are, are likely to change, but not likely to uh, be uh, at uh, the 70 part per billion level for sure. And so we wanted to uh, make uh, people aware uh, of the, the differences. Um, and on your, the, the question that you asked uh, regarding will we uh, update the interim health advisories? I think that the work that we're doing to develop the MCLGs, which as Eric mentioned, would be proposed uh, later this year, um, will reflect all of the um, uh, uh, adjustments uh, as a result of the recommendations made by the SAB, and um, uh, in in all likelihood will um, supplant um, those values. Whether they, I, I don't know if there's been a decision on the status of that interim health advisory, Eric. Perhaps you can. Add yeah, Betsy, I, I think you've captured everything. What I'll just reflect is what's in our. Q's and A's on this point on our, our, our website, which is, as you've said, you know, the, we're, we're going to respond to the SAB comments as we move forward to developing the maximum contaminant level goal that's going to be in support of the National Primary Drinking Water Rule. And at that time, when we propose the MCLGs, we may update or remove the interim health advisories for PFOA and PFOS based on the best available science at that time. But, but Mark, I, I, I understand your question and we appreciate the, the concern that's been raised. But uh, as Betsy indicated, up until June 15th, the agency's advice was that at levels of 70 parts per trillion or, or lower, uh, you know, the agency didn't believe there was uh, at the risk of adverse effects. So the, the primary motivating fact for the agency was to, uh, based on the information that we had and the preliminary reviews that we needed to provide more updated information as many states and water systems across the country are working to address PFAS contamination in drinking water. Okay, I just, um, so when the, M if the MCLG is, higher than the health advisory, you intend to um, withdraw the health advisories just so that we now end up with multiple kind of levels that might be confusing for, you know, trying to, you know, people, people trying to discuss different endpoints. That, that's so, an option anyway. So yes, Mark, I mean, again, I think when, and again, we will only be proposing uh, a, a standard this year. So um, as we as we propose that standard, we're gonna be evaluating the health advisories at that point in time um, to update them or to, re to remove them uh, depending on you know the, the ongoing need for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Ruiz and then uh, Dr. Post. Great. Uh, thank you so much for, for the introduction. Um, my question is related to the previous question, and that is, is there talking points for, for instance, treatment plans or regulatory um, state agencies trying to address the concern from the public that the EPA says that the health advisory set so much lower that can actually be measured? So I think that there is a lot of confusion from the public and from laboratories about how to address the general public. And if there's um, any EPA talking points to, to help um, states, uh, regulatory agencies, PWSIDs to have that conversation with the public. Thank you. So Betsy, uh, Betsy showed a slide in which uh, she, she indicated the website um, that had a number of materials on it? And the answer uh, is yes. Um, on that website and uh, uh, are a number of fact sheets, community fact sheets. There's Q&A doc, Q documents. Uh, there's actually a number of translations of that, uh, that fact sheet. 
uh, all of which are designed to both communicate uh, with officials, uh, uh, local officials who are trying to make decisions, but also that are community focused um, uh, communication materials uh, talking about many of the issues that you've mentioned. Anything further, Dr. Hernandez Ruiz? No, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, yes, in fact, there is. Um, so thank you, thank you for those talking points. Is there anything being done proactively to make sure that that information is disseminated? So in other words, we have it out there for people to go gather it and, and look at it, but that, that takes time and, and a high level of expertise that most average consumer won't have. So what kind of outreach um, efforts um, if there's any being planned by the EPA to not be a pull effort rather than a push to the public. Uh, so uh, one of the things the agency did, uh, and Betsy and I have been involved in a number of these, was convene a number of meetings with our state and local partners um, uh, to uh, announce the availability of the materials. We've also reached out to water utilities who uh, we recognize are at the forefront of dealing with these contamination issues to try and give them the tools that they have. Um, and we, we held a, a general public webinar to try and explain uh, the health advisories uh, to community, uh, communities, community groups. So we've, we've undertaken a number of steps to try and share this information that we have provided to the public for the purpose of, 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 of their awareness um, and uh, we continue to do that. Betsy and I were just on a call this morning with uh, some communities talking about the health advisors. Any follow-up, Dr. Hernandez Ruiz? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Post. Thank you. So I'm following up on Dr. Le Chevalier's question or comments about the health advisory or the and value in the MCLG that you plan to propose as part of the rule proposal. So I just wanted to like bring out or ask for comment. The health advisories are based on non-cancer effects and reference doses, but MCLGs, if they also consider carcinogenic effects as well as non-cancer effects. So for PFOA in your draft documents that the SAB reviewed, it was um, considered to be a likely human carcinogen and if that remains and doesn't get changed, it's my understanding MCLGs for likely carcinogens would be zero. Like, so that would be different, not necessary. Like, it's not just that the reference dose might change at, and the non cancer health, the value, like for non cancer effects for the health advisory, but also if. PFOA remains a likely human carcinogen that can affect the MCLG and for the, the carcinogenicity, which wasn't considered in the health advisory. Can you, is that, can you clarify that or is that correct? Um, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, we we uh, are planning to have um, summaries uh, in the um, documents supporting the MCLG of both cancer and non-cancer. Um, so all of that information will be updated. We were asked by the SAB um, uh, chartered group to go back and evaluate the cancer data and we're doing that. So that will all be presented as well as um, uh, any um, uh, updates that we will be making to the um, non-cancer effects. I think that's your question. But um, if it is a policy of EPA or the approach still, if it is a PFOA was in the draft a likely human carcinogen. If it that does not change, would it the MCLG be zero for that? That's what so, I. So, so Gloria, I, I, we we can't comment on uh, the the outcome of a proposal we have yet made. But I, what I will do is confirm that for likely carcinogen in the past, the EPA has established an MCLG of zero. Uh, but I can't I can't commit one way or another to what the agency will propose uh, this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neptune. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, um, I, I was just wondering whether there was a comment on whether there is going to be any advancements in the detection protocols, devices, et cetera, that will allow kind of 
better monitoring approaches that will kind of increase kind of the, the kind of usefulness of these interim health advisory kind of targets because I mean, that um, discrepancy is, I mean, the question is whether that's of any value because we aren't able going to be able to get there in any reasonable period of time. So uh, Dr. Neptuna, it's a, it's a great question, but let me first observe that we're talking about uh, the ability to measure PFOA, PFOS, and GenX and PFBS at single parts per trillion, which represents really advanced uh, abilities to quantify contaminants. Um, so we, we, let's, not, let's not sort of lose track of the fact that we're quite proud of the ability to sort of get at such low levels to begin with. Recognizing, however, that this still puts uh, the quantitation levels at levels above what uh, we've determined to be uh, levels uh, that are without risk. Um, so, you know, the answer is yes, the agency continues to do a lot of work with regards to improving our abilities to measure PFAS. Uh, an area of focus is uh, we want to be able to measure more PFAS. There are literally thousands of PFAS. Uh, and so we want to develop analytical methods that can measure greater numbers of those PFAS in drinking water. But we also seek to identify ways in which we can improve the analytical precision at which we can measure these at lower and lower levels. Um, but right now we think we've got state-of-the-art methods uh, out there when it comes to drinking water, uh, but we'll continue um, as an agency and with our other partners to try and improve uh, analytical performance. Um, there are a number of contaminants uh, for which you know, analytical methods winds up being a limiting factor when we set our standards. Um, as, as Gloria was just reminding us, there's a number of carcinogens for which the agency has set a zero health goal. Um, and quite often, uh, uh, quite a number of our existing maximum contaminant levels are set based on analytical feasible for those feasibility for those contaminants. So the improved performance of analytical methods remains, uh, you know, a, a, a high priority for the agency. But we we need to move forward with what we know right now in terms of the best available technology and 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 science and data to support that. But it's Thank a great you. question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan, and then Dr. Hernandez Ruiz. Thank, oops, yeah. Thank you yes. um, for the the good overview. Um, I mean, I know it's there's still a lot to be done for PFAS and PFOA, but you just mentioned um, quickly at the end that you're working on um, developing national primary drinking water regs for other PFAS and groups of PFAS. I wonder if you could just briefly talk about what um, what's going on there, what the plans are for that. It's a great question, Dr. Tan. So um, what we committed to as a part of that same regulation, let me be clear that this is not a separate rulemaking we're talking about, is we're evaluating options uh, as an agency for addressing more than just PFOA and PFOS uh, in the context of the National Primary Drinking Water Regulations. One of the pieces of information that we're particularly interested in your feedback on is that third document that I mentioned, the evaluation of mixtures in drinking water that could inform our evaluations. Uh, other factors that come into play when it comes to evaluating additional PFAS would be the degree to which we have uh, methods to measure those contaminants, as well as uh, the availability of treatment technologies that may co-remove those. So we're particularly focused on that latter category, what, what PFAS might be co-removed uh, when you're treating to remove PFOA and PFOS. Uh, so there'll be more information that we present when we propose this regulation, uh, but I, I, I do want to emphasize one of, the, one, of the, one of the items that will be particularly helpful for our deliberations is that mixtures uh, methodology that the SAB is reviewing. Anything further? No, thank you. All right, thanks. Let's move to Dr. Hernandez Ruiz. Thank you. Um, so my question or comment goes back to uh, Dr. Neptune's question in regards to how low can laboratories measure right now? Um, I actually engaged um, with the Association of Public Health Laboratories as well as other state laboratories that follow prescribed EPA methods. And um, 
and explore, continue to explore lower detection limits, um, you know, for scientific purposes, as well as, um, for instance, this new uh, health advisory level, right? And so the consensus is that laboratories cannot generate blanks low enough um, to be around the health advisory levels. Um, base case scenario with the latest technology, which is not EPA approved, um, concentrations down to the 50 to 100 parts per quadrillion can be seen versus the four parts per quadrillion. So this is a heavy concern, a, a, a you know, that does, probably the, the top um, topic of conversation and concern for public health laboratories, particularly that have to follow the EPA methods, which are not set up to be able to see down to these levels. So th thank you, Dr. Hernandez, Ruiz. Uh, and let me just clear, let, let me just reiterate what I think you said was you were referring to the ability to measure at the parts per quadrillion level. Um, and that was based on your conversation with APHL, and, and we also work with APHL and other laboratory organizations. Um, and so I want to just reiterate something that was on Betsy's slide to make sure folks know what our basis when it comes to PFOA and PFOS for that minimum reporting level is, is when we did validation studies for those methods, uh, we worked with a number of laboratories to evaluate their performance. And we developed that MRL based on our estimate of what 75% of labs can achieve with a 95% confidence, right? So we're trying to assess what laboratories can do, recognizing that any monitoring program we might develop associated with the drinking water rule is going to be um, utilizing the laboratories across the country um, uh, and their ability. So we try to assess uh, what labs are capable of. And so that's that's our basis for the MRL, I which I think is entirely consistent with what you just said. I just wanted to add a little more detail to that. Anything further, Celine? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you for, for taking the feedback about, you know, what laboratories can do right now um, that go beyond what the current EPA approved methods are capable of um, determining concentrations for. Thank you. Dr. Post, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'd like to request or that EPA makes it a little clearer in their the information, such as fact sheets and websites and things, information communication to the public, that these health advisories for PFO, the interim health advisories for PFO and PFOS apply to short term as well as lifetime exposure. It's stated that they are are protective for all life stages throughout the li people's lives, which is true because they're based on the most sensitive endpoint, but many it's been interpreted and in the media, and I've heard it said multiple times that this is based, you have to be exposed above these levels for your entire life to be, have a health risk um, because that's how people who don't understand it are interpreting that it's protective throughout their lives, the statement. The, actually, the technical documents, the PFOA and PFAS health advisory documents, which are the technical documents that most lay people don't read, state it very clearly that because it's based on an effect that occurs in children from a shorter term exposure, they're applicable to short term exposures via drinking water. But that is, in my opinion, hasn't been clearly communicated um, in the public and other general information. And it's really important because it has to do with the time frame of concern in which something should be addressed once it's detected in water. We've had issues in New Jersey with the older health advisories on that point. So I can you address that at all? And I really request that it be more clearly communicated in the public information. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Post. Uh, I appreciate it. As you were, were talking, I was thinking I would point you to the technical fact sheet where it's that exact uh, phenomenon is described in- The fact sheet, I only saw it- In like greater detail. Document. It's the, te the technical fact sheet, like you just like you said. So you, you said what I was going to say, but I, I take your, your concern that, um, and, and probably um, should have reinforced that myself 
in as I described what the lifetime health advisory was in in my presentation that is also applicable to um, uh, shorter term uh, life stages. Um, so I'll, I'll take that uh, to back and, and see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we move to our quality review? Dr. Hernandez Ruiz, you have your hand up again, or it might just still be up. Okay, it's down. Sorry. All right. Yeah, thanks for all those excellent questions and certainly for the answers from the directors. That was great. I would like to begin the quality review of the SAB draft report titled Review of EPA's Analyses to Support EPA's National Primary Drinking Water Rulemaking for PFAS. Quality review of SAB panel and committee reports is a key function of this chartered board. The board has to make a determination about the quality of all of our draft reports. So we will first hear a brief introduction from Dr. Wei Su Chu, chair of the SAB panel that delivered the report and that developed it. The review of EPA's analyses to support the National Primary Drinking Water Rulemaking for PFAS was conducted by the PFAS review panel of the SAB. And then we'll hear comments from lead reviewers, from SAB members who are designated. The lead reviewers for this report are Drs. Marjorie Aileon, Mark Borsuk, Celine Hernandez-Ruiz, Dominic van der Mensbrugge, and June Weintraub. And then after hearing the lead reviewer comments, I'll ask Dr. Chu to provide any brief response. And then we'll open that up to SAB members for additional comments as part of that quality review discussion. I want to focus everyone on the discussion um, and the questions that are our responsibility in this function of quality review. First, whether the original charge questions to the SAB panel are adequately addressed. Second, whether there are any technical errors or omissions in the report or issues that are inadequately dealt with in the SAB panel report. Third, whether the panel report is clear and logical. And fourth, whether the conclusions drawn or recommendations provided are supported by the body of the SAB panel's report. Then uh, we will move to motions about the disposition of the draft report. There's a few different directions we can go there, so we'll hold off on that for now. Uh, and I will now move to asking Dr. Chu to summarize the report. Go ahead, Dr. Chu. Thank you very much. Um, you can go to the next slide. So first, I really wanted to thank our PFAS review panel, uh, a number of whom are on the line here as part of the chartered SAB members. Um, and you know, they all really did a, a yeoman's job in terms of putting together this report, uh, you know, reading the, the thousands of pages of, of documentation that we were tasked to, uh, to review. Uh, next slide. So uh, just by way of background, we had a number of uh, public uh, meetings uh, by remote, uh, by Zoom. Uh, first was in uh, end of December where the, it was uh, where EPA introduced the documents and we discussed the charge questions and asked for clarification as to the charge questions. Then in early January, January we uh, spent three days deliberating on the charge questions uh, and coming up with our, our draft uh, conclusions uh, based on first on the discussions and then everyone else uh, pitching in uh, as is the usual process. And then uh, we spent time drafting the report and we finalized the draft report in another public meeting in May. Uh, and throughout this process, both oral and written comments were uh, considered by the uh, review panel. Next slide. So uh, as you heard from EPA earlier, uh, there are four documents that are prepared as uh, proposed for the proposed rulemaking process um, of PFO and PFAS. And uh, the four documents are here, the first two of which uh, I'll discuss uh, our response first, but those were the approaches for deriving the maximum contaminant level goal for PFOA and PFAS in drinking water. So next slide. So uh, I've inserted here a slide from the EPA introduction, uh, introductory presentation, just to remind everyone as to the purpose and scope of these proposed uh, drafts, is really uh, they do not derive an MCLG themselves. They're meant to support the development of the MCLG. Um, and they contain a synthesis of the toxicological and uh, basically the animal and epi epidemiologic data on PFOA and PFAS, uh, they derive toxicity values uh, as well as the 
um, the data supporting the relative source contribution uh, determination, that both of which will be needed to support the MCLG. Next slide. So uh, in terms of the major recommendations, uh, obviously I'm not gonna you know, summarize every single uh, recommendation here, but uh, going through each of the sections individually, in terms of study identification and inclusion, this is for their literature review in terms of uh, putting together the, ba the scientific basis of these documents. Uh, we requested them to basically have a more complete and more transparent process uh, in terms of identifying uh, and deciding which studies uh, are eligible for inclusion. Uh, specifically, there are studies included in the, um, in the 2016 uh, health advisory that really should be included more completely in this process, since their former literature search was really only in the post-2016 um, uh, era. For uh, non-cancer hazard identification, which is you know, determining the, the, which uh, non-cancer health effects, uh, there's uh, you know, evidence that PFOA or PFAS are, uh, um, are influencing the, the um, incidence or severity of those diseases. We uh, recommended that they really separate the hazard from the dose response assessment processes, uh, consistent with you know, sort of modern frameworks for evidence synthesis and integration. Currently, the dose response in terms of determining points of departure uh, and the hazard for determining the causation are kind of mixed together. Uh, and so we uh, recommended that they really separ separate those processes. Uh, given the volume of literature and the, you know, you know, the need to uh, move expeditiously with uh, these uh, assessments, uh, we recommend that, that they focus on endpoints with the strongest uh, evidence in the view of the committee. And those include the liver, uh, immune effects, serum lipids, and the fetal growth. Uh, they specifically also asked a question about ALT as a marker for liver effects. And um, we recommended that they do include the, um, that endpoint in the, from the, uh, given that there's substantial clinical and epidemiologic literature that uh, ALT uh, elevations are a marker for uh, adverse liver effects, uh, as well as adverse uh, morbidity and mortality uh, longer term. Next slide. In terms of cancer hazard identification and the slow factor, uh, we did agree with the likely designation for PFOA, but we I thought that a more structured and transparent weight of evidence discussion was needed for both PFOA and PFAS. Um, so more in lines with the cancer guidelines and, and really walking through those, um, that uh, weight of evidence uh, determination uh, more systematically. Additionally, um, we recommended that they develop multiple cancer slow factors uh, and then uh, you know, discuss the strengths and limitations of the different candidate values before deciding on uh, an actual a final uh, value to recommend. Uh, and then, uh, and this goes not only for the cancer uh, slow factor derivation, but throughout, in terms of quantitative modeling, additional details and transparency were needed in terms of the particular uh, results that the model inputs, uh, et cetera, um, that uh, throughout not only this, but also in this next section, um, toxokinetic modeling, where we also uh, talked about how the model code, the parameters, the comparisons between model predictions and data, all that needed to be spelled out in more detail. Additionally, we uh, recommended that they reconsider their choice of toxokinetic model for humans. And uh, in the documents, they use the Werner et al. model, um, but we thought that the Gaiden et al. model might be more appropriate for supporting the MCLG. And this is because the Gaiden et al. model, uh, well, it gives very similar fits to the data, um, it uh, incorporates life stage specific changes in, um, in the uh, drinking water rates and other exposure factors that, um, uh, so it is based on a constant um, drinking water concentration that would be considered uh, protective rather than a constant dose rate. And given that uh, the amount of water uh, per uh, kilogram body weight that's consumed changes uh, through life stages, uh, that the, this uh, the gate model might be more appropriate for supporting something like an MCLG, which is uh, a, um, a role for a um, concentration in drinking water and not an intake level. Next slide. In terms of the derivation for of the reference dose, uh, we recommended that they consider multiple human and animal studies uh, for a variety of endpoints and populations, uh, and then also that they consider. Uh, in the same vein as just discussed for toxokinetic modeling, expressing those in water concentration equivalents 
Um, so that again, these life stage specific differences in ingestion rates and, and toxokinetics half-life, for instance, um, would be uh, better accounted for. Uh, we uh, recommended that they have more transparent and stronger justifications for the particular benchmark responses that were uh, benchmark response levels that were selected for their BMD modeling. Uh, and also consider adopting a probabilistic framework that uh, in lines with science and decisions from 2000, the NAS report from 2009 uh, and several publications in the open literature since then to calculate risk specific doses. Because given that uh, if the MCLG is going to be lower than is technically feasible, the risk specific doses uh, provide you know, a way to calculate economic um, or health benefits uh, in a uh, quantitative way that given that, as EPA mentioned earlier, um, sort of technical or feasibility uh, MCLs, the enforceable limits need to take cost and benefit uh, into account. Uh, and then lastly, to still clearly state that these apply to both short-term and chronic exposure, uh, because again, of these life stage specific differences uh, in ingestion traits and toxokinetics, and also that informs the needs of, community, of communities as to how urgent it is to uh, reduce those um, the levels of PFAS uh, in the drinking water. Uh, and then finally, with the relative source contribution, uh, we supported the selection of the 20%, but had some suggestions as to how to better describe the rationale. For Next slide. So the second uh, uh, document, well, the third document actually that was reviewed is a draft framework for uh, mixtures uh, uh, assessment for non-cancer effects uh, associated with PFAS. Next slide. So again, this is uh, um, from EPA's introduction, uh, introductory uh, presentation about this framework. Um, its perfect purpose is to sort of outline different approaches a framework for considering different approaches for looking at mixtures of PFAS. Um, it is it recommends basing uh, um, mixtures and cumulative risk based on a common health outcome or endpoint, not necessarily a common uh, mechanism. Uh, it assumes uh, dose additivity and provides uh, some discussion of three different mixture assessment based uh, component based approaches, the hazard index, relative potency factors, and a mixture benchmark dose approach. Next slide. So uh, some recommendations from the panel, uh, we do support the use of dose additivity based on the common outcome, although we did suggest the need for a clear presentation of some of the uncertainties and as, as well as information that actually support uh, this approach. In terms of the hazard index, the relative potency factor and the mixture BMD, um, we questioned the, uh, the framework having, uh, you know, articulating a tiered approach, which be, uh, implying that, you know, at uh, you know, certain as you would be moving up tiers in terms of level of complexity with additional data, particularly because PFAS are an extraordinarily data poor um, and uh, a set of chemicals with a lot of data gaps. And that we suggested this re be replaced with more of a menu based framework, which would sort of outline, you know, the data needs uh, and requirements and assumptions of each of the different approaches and thereby better support kind of fit for purpose selection of approaches and not put them into sort of a tiers that sort of implies kind of this is a lower quality or, or has more uncertainty and these other approaches have a higher uncertainty since these don't necessarily have that sort of um, ordinal kind of, um, uh, kind of, of um, level of confidence to them. There's also a clarification needed as to what similarities and differences were among the different approaches since there's cases in which they actually converge mathematically uh, in terms of the arithmetic. So just you know, being a little bit clear as to how these different approaches are different when they give the same or very uh, you know, comparable answers and when they might give different answers. Um, and the other thing was to be clear as to for the, particularly for the relative potency factor and the mixture benchmark dose, to be basing the sort of weighting on using human equivalent doses and not necessarily administered doses, uh, given that they, uh, the different data sets might be from different species. Uh, and uh, you know that, so that converting all the doses, uh, all the uh, reported experimental doses in human equivalent terms would be a, a stronger basis. And so the final document that reviewed was an analysis of cardiovascular risk reduction um, based on PFO and PFOS in, uh, in drinking water. Next slide. 
So again, this is from EPA's uh, overview presentation. Um, so the idea is to look at uh, reductions in drinking water concentrations, determine uh, using a pharmacokinetic model how those reductions in drinking water concentrations affect uh, serum levels of PFO and PFOS, uh, and then how that then uh, using the dose response function from serum cholesterol to dose response, then uh, to, sorry, between serum levels of PFO and PFOS and serum levels of cholesterol markers, how that then leads to an um, improvement in the uh, total cholesterol. And then that change in total cholesterol is then put into a um, risk model that's uh, developed by uh, the um, our atherosclerotic cardiovascular uh, disease model by the American College of Cardiology. And that then is put into a light table analysis, which then would, um, uh, would output what the change in incidence of CBD, both fatal and non-fatal would be. So this is sort of a daisy chain of several different analyses together, and they wanted our review of that uh, overall approach. Next slide. So in terms of the meta-analysis and the like table approach and the use of the ASCSV uh, 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 CVD model, um, we, uh, we felt that there's a number of recommendations from the MCLG uh, documents in terms of the study, study identification um, and the uh, synthesis that uh, could be should be applied here as well where applicable um, since uh, you know since this analysis would um, be uh, after the uh, literature review and, and hazard synthesis. Uh, we supported the overall approach, although there was some apparent discrepancy in terms of the conclusions um, in the MCLG document on CBD, where it seemed to be not as strongly supported in the MCLG document but then here in the um, CVD reduction document, it, it seems like there was, it was seemed, there was just a little bit of a disconnect. But I think you know, with our recommendations on the MCLG documents, that sh should um, be clear, and there should be a sort of a, a um, closer dovetailing between the MCLG documents as they are revised and this uh, risk reduction analysis. Uh, and then uh, in a similar vein, additional discussion was needed as to the rationale for using this endpoint. And also we recommended consideration of other endpoints for risk reduction analysis. I think EPA clarified that they were considering other endpoints, but because this analysis was more novel uh, for CVD, they wanted specifically uh, SAB input on, uh, on this particular uh, approach. Uh, lastly, in terms of uncertainties and limitations, we highlighted the, clarity, the need for additional clarity, uh, including uh, some, uh, some sensitivity analyses as to you know, the uh, assumptions uh, that are underlying the analysis, as well as additional discussion of their exclusion of high density lipoprotein um, and whether its inclusion, uh, to what extent it would really influence the ultimate uh, um, risk reduction uh, conclusions. Next slide. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, uh, or, or we can just move right into the uh, lead discussant um, uh, quality review. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Chu, and thanks to the whole panel. Really a tremendous amount of work went into this, so very much appreciate that. Um, I was thinking we would move to the lead reviewers and then maybe back to you, Dr. Chu, for any responses and then open it up to everyone for questions. So I think that'll give everyone a chance to um, to be able to respond. So lead reviewers, I'll take you in alphabetical order. So Dr. Marjorie Elion, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cullen. Well, first I have to really thank this panel. It was an incredible effort and, uh, and very detailed and so helpful. And also to thank EPA for the original documents, which in the presentation, because that obviously there's been a lot of work done in that. So in terms of the charge questions, let me just say that I consider that this draft report is just highly detailed and addresses the charge questions posed by EPA. And there are the extensive list of references in support of the conclusions and recommendations in the report are really helpful and obviously can be accessed for additional detail that wasn't provided in the report. I found no technical errors or omissions in the draft report. And I found that the report was clear and logical. It's obviously very long and detailed. so. Um, so where there was a little redundancy, it would seem appropriate. And what I wanted to do today was more to 
uh, for the question four, are the conclusions drawn or recommendations provided supported by the body of the draft report? There are a few recommendations I wanted to reiterate and provide just a few comments. So in general, I thought that the conclusions drawn, they were supported by the report um, and the few conclusions I'd like to, to reiterate you, that um, early in the, the report on the proposed approaches to the derivation of a draft maximum contaminant level goal for PFO and PFOS in drinking water, the report stated that the decision to exclude literature published within the time frame of the development of the 2016 health effects document um, in the current literature search was unjustified and that the rationale for not considering studies, particularly human studies that were included in the 2016 health effects support documents is not clear or supportable. So it would really be helpful to have a much better understanding of EPA's rationale for excluding or including these major research uh, documents, particularly when the research is relatively current and directly relevant to the issue under investigation and includes human data. And also it'd be interesting to see by including or excluding those, what the outcome is in terms of the conclusions drawn by, by EPA. One of the other uh, recommendations a little further on, on cancer designation charge question number three says that the panel suggests that the mammary tumor development be considered as an additional endpoint associated with PFOS. And then it continues that the lack of inclusion of mechanistic data and the weight of evidence for PFOS carcinogenicity. Um, so the recommendation is that this mechanistic data should be included and discussed. And I really agree that tumor development should be considered in, in general, um, you know, what were the EPA actions related to determining cancer designation of PFOS, the most specific biological endpoints that are scientifically indicated should be concluded. The primary reference identified by the panel in the report in this section was published in 2021. So I think it just in some ways reflects the importance of continuous examination of recently published research in this area. And um, Betsy Beal in her comments earlier today, suggested that yes, EPA is currently looking at um, and continuously looking at current data. And because there is limited data, anything that's coming out, and I believe there will be a lot more things coming out, it, it is an ongoing effort. The third recommendation related to charge question on the epidemiological study, the reference dose derivation, um, and the recommendation made in the report was um, to consider multiple studies of a variety of endpoints, that is consider antibody response to vaccines, serum lipids, liver enzymes, and birth weight in different populations so as to provide convergent evidence that is more reliable than any single study or health endpoint. And I really agree again with this recommendation because regardless of conflicting results associated with research, and this is a general comment, sort of expanding the endpoints that may be relevant is really important for future research, um, which may be directed towards some of these um, conclusions. And whether or not this was in cancer or a non-cancer health endpoint, conflicting results warrant continued investigation and may warrant further consideration. So um, again, additional research will be carried out and may more add the, the clarity on why results are conflicting or actually provide a consensus on research conclusions. On the uncertainty factors, this is on the draft report, page 70. Um, this was really related about the rationale for supporting the application of the selected uncertainty factors and has uncertainty been adequately accounted for in the derivation of the reference doses. And the report recommends that the agency consider the adoption of a probabilistic framework, including an uncertainty factor distribution rather than a fixed value to calculate risk specific doses as a replacement for traditional reference doses. And I really agree with this because probabilistic frameworks are appropriate and using in general, again, several models and comparing the results may help be helpful to, in uh, justifying EPA decisions. 
in this particular area, the um, MCLs and PFO and MCLGs, I think it'll be highly scrutinized and quantifying uncertainty as opposed to saying that, um, you know, we don't think it's going to be a big problem will be, I think, add additional support to EPA's line of evidence. And finally, the last one is on the hazard index approach, charge question number two. Um, and the report uh, was asked to provide feedback on whether the proposed hazard index methodologies in the framework are scientifically supported for PFAS mixture risk assessments. And the report um, concluded that in the future, EPA should consider the extent to which using the corresponding probabilistic reference dose or risk specific doses would change the proposed hazard index target organ specific hazard index approach. And um, I really agree that it's so important with these reference doses or other types of um, values that EPA generates that are then are used in, uh, by many people to, uh, for other kinds of calculations to make sure that they are set um, and examined in multiple ways and then compared, that those reference values are compared that are calculated. Um, there are currently scrutiny about certain validity of some commonly held models like the linear no threshold model. And so I think that again, to uh, show due diligence, something such as the reference dose and its associated impact on the Hitoshi are, are warranted. So I was really, again, impressed amazingly amount of work done by this committee. And um, that's the end of my comments. Thank you and agreed. Dr. <laughs> Borsak, you're up. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm just gonna uh, uh, briefly cover some of the um, answers to the questions regarding the, uh, the ability to address the charge questions. So the first one was were the charge questions adequately addressed. Um, I felt like they were overall. Um, the one exception was in charge question 2B. Um, they asked the SAB panel to provide your recommendations for modeling approaches. Um, that's for the consideration of the ALT endpoint um, for driving the, uh, the pod or POD for the liver health effects. Um, the panel does recommend this endpoint, but they don't provide any recommendations for modeling approaches. So given that that was asked for explicitly, it would be helpful, I think, if the panel could um, provide some recommendations to the degree to which they have any. I suspect that um, the EPA would find that helpful. Um, I had a few, um, this next question was on technical errors or omissions. I didn't find anything um, substantial, substantive. Um, I did have a few grammatical corrections and word omissions, which I can send along um, separately. Um, the third question was, is the draft report clear and logical? Um, I did feel like it was in general. There was one section and I identified in part because it was highlighted also, I believe in the cover letter. Um, the SAB panel suggested that the phrase external peer review be broadened um, to recommend the need for scientific input and review in general. And I was a bit unclear as to what the intent of this recommendation was. Um, it may have been to suggest that review does not need to be external, for example, or it might be to suggest that the review has to be scientific, um, or perhaps to point out that there are some other forms of input beyond peer review. I wasn't quite clear what distinction they were trying to make. So it'd be helpful, I think, if the panel could provide a bit more detail on that particular, and their intention with that recommendation. Um, and then finally, are the conclusions supported? And I felt that they were. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Dr. Hernandez Ruiz, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I have been sick for the last couple of days, so I don't have anything else to contribute um, to what has been said up to this point. Thank you. Thanks for your earlier questions. That was helpful. Dr. Dominique van der Mensbrugge. Thank you. Uh, I read the, the report several times. It was a, a very difficult read for me, way, way out of my comfort zone. But I was very impressed by, by the depth uh, of, the, uh, of the report. So on, on the four specific questions, um, I do believe that the charge questions were adequ adequately addressed by the panel. Uh, I did not identify any errors or omissions in the draft report. Um, the, uh, the technical nature of the issues addressed, the draft report is largely clear and logical. And uh, I add thorough. And uh, I, I think the, the conclusions and recommendations are supported by the draft report. 
I just have two additional comments that, that relate to the uh, report on cardiovascular disease. I think um, it would be good for the, the report to strengthen the recommendation to link the CVD report with the, with the MCGL report. It seemed that the recommendation there was, was a little bit uh, weak in my view, because it seems like this is an important, an important area for, this, um, uh, for, the, for the review report. I also um, think that the draft report could highlight some of the challenges in incorporating more population heterogeneity. Uh, for example, the risk of CBD changes with age and that the ASCBD model has limited parameterization across age in some populations. So again, the report I think could, could stress more broadly uh, the, the uh, heterogeneity issue. And that's all I have, thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Weintraub. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I will echo the comments on the thoroughness, both of the panel's report and response to the charge questions, as well as um, EPA staff's work to compile all of that information. It really is a tremendous body of work. Um, I did find that the charge questions were adequately addressed. I did not find any technical errors. I found a few grammatical things that I put in my um, written comments. With respect to the clear and logical question, I do think it's extremely well-written report. It's giant um, and has a lot of um, subsections. I know that there is sort of a standard format that all of these reports try to adhere to, um, to the extent that it would be allowed. I suggest addition of of subheaders um, in as many locations as possible because some of the sections are so long and it's really um, easy to get lost as the new reader um, as to where, where I am as I'm moving through. Um, the one detailed suggestion I made was to revise the headers in the um, I think it was one of the earlier sections on the literature review, just to match what, um, what is actually done in the EPA document that was being reviewed so that, again, the reader could orient themselves. I found the conclusions drawn um, were provided uh, and recommendations were well supported. And um, I, I do agree um, with the comment that were made by others um, about needing some support for why um, some, some of the um, reference literature was left out sort of blanket as a blanket decision. Um, so additional support for that or um, revisiting some of those documents. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks to all the lead reviewers. Uh, Dr. Chu, would you like to comment at all in response to the lead reviewer comments? I thought we could have a few minutes for that and then we'll move to a break and then we'll open it up to everyone for discussion. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, I think mainly, I think Dr. Elian was really, um, I didn't hear any specific um, recommendations for changing the report. I think it was just emphasizing um, some something that were of particular importance interview. Um, I, I, I think we'll look over the um, we'll look over the letter at the beginning and make sure that those some of those specific points are are highlighted uh, from the report. It, it maybe maybe that will address her her comments. Um, in terms of uh, Dr. Borsak's comments, uh, in terms of the modeling approach for ALT, um, I didn't think that we were going to recommend anything um, particularly um, innovative or novel there beyond the, the usual sort of benchmark dose kind of point of departure. Um, and, uh, you know, we did, uh, there are comments about selecting the benchmark response level uh, later on, I think, and needing justification there. 
Um, so I think we'll take a look at that and make sure if there's some cross referencing there or just additional clarity as to, to what we were exactly saying. Um, and then on the external peer review questions. So this stems from, you know, this was for the mixtures document, I think. So it, the idea for mixtures is to, to, you know, do these weighted averages with available um, points departure or reference doses in calculating hazard index. And the concern we heard from uh, one of the reviewers that uh, uh, works at the state level is that um, there, you know, in some cases, you know, states might be implementing this guidance on their own using their own review of the literature for particular PFAS that, you know, are not of necessarily national importance, but are of particularly for their uh, location. And that uh, although, you know, obviously there needs to be a, a scientific, scientific review of those, that they aren't necessarily, they might not necessarily qualify as a technically an external peer review because they might have, you know, an ex, uh, a standing panel of scientists that um, that type of uh, process in terms of reviewing um, their, uh, you know, their hazard uh, and dose response assessments. And so th they wanted us to kind of, um, you know, make the language a little bit more flexible to, so, that, so as to accommodate that type of review process, uh, even if it isn't, even if it, it, it could be argued that it's not a pure external peer review. So I think um, maybe, with the, you know, that needs to be clarified in terms of kind of the motivation um, as in the, the context for that, uh, for that, that recommendation. Maybe, maybe an example or two of what you would like to have included that wouldn't otherwise be. Okay, sound good, sounds good. Uh, and then uh, I think, you know, in terms of the comments about um, highlighting some challenges in terms of population heterogeneity for the CBD document, you know, we can go back and look, look there, uh, see an appropriate place for that. Um, and then in terms of the headers and uh, uh, revising the headers and, and subheaders, uh, Sue and I will work to, to try to make sure that those are uh, make it so that the document is uh, more easily navigable by a reader. Thanks. That's super helpful. Uh, let's see. I make it 1127. So huge thanks to the panel and Dr. Chu in particular, and also to all the lead reviewers. Um, we will take a 10 minute break right now, and then we'll move to comments from the whole uh, the whole board. So let's see. What is it? It's 1128. So let's return at 1138. And yeah, we'll be ready for more comments. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everyone. We're going to reconvene. All right, so following our previous discussion, I'd like to open this now to hear comments from any SAB member um, on the report as part of our quality review. Let's see, John Samet, go ahead, and then Dr. Hernandez Ruiz. Dr. Samet. Okay, good. And uh, wish I, I, your group did an admirable uh, job. My, my comment is sort of more cross cutting, and I'll I'm coming at this, as you know, I, have, I think I've chaired five committees at the National Academies in the last 10 years, looking at EPA methods for evidence gathering, synthesis, and integration. The problem I see with the way you've described the flaws in the report is that you can list them, but some of them you really can't fix. And once you've started, for example, with doing a systematic review without a protocol, there's no sort of turning the time clock backwards and doing a redo. And some of the other comments that are made just sort of point to uh, flaws around uh, transparency and selection or evaluation and so on. There's sort of a, a catalog of things that didn't go right that I think you've documented. That said, is there something cross-cutting needed that essentially says there are many flaws, some of them are remediable perhaps with a short term and some may, may not be and there are consequences. And you know, it, I, I wrote some language. To me, the, the documents you described don't represent the state of practice at present around you know, information gathering. I mean, IRIS is making steps. You're, I'm sure, aware that there was just a review of probably on the committee of the IRIS handbook. And, um, you know, progress is being made within parts of the um, agency, but some of the same problems you've listed here have shown up in reviews of TSCA, TSCA documents, TSCA approaches. And you allude to this general issue. I mean, you mentioned OHAT, uh, for example, is a worked out approach, but I wonder if there doesn't need to be at least a sort of broader paragraph. I've suggested a, even a sentence for the letter to the administrator that essentially points to the fact that um, what you've documented is problems in the review that are not the state of, um, of practice. Actually, notice John Morris has his hand up. I think he raised the same issue in his comment about, you know, is there a need to start over in a sense? Um, one might do that if there were multiple years ahead to, to do a redo. I guess that's probably not on the uh, table, but I, I, w I wonder if the report would not benefit from some sort of overarching comment. And I think probably particularly in the letter to the administrator to highlight that there's, you know, that there are broad problems. It is not the state of practice. And if things move forward on a rapid timetable, the, we, we know that the document is is not perfect. And I, I, I don't see things that can be fixed with some, some flaws that can be fixed with quick interventions. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And there is a sentence I suggested drifting, um, drifting around if we want to look at it. Thanks, Dr. Samet. Uh, Dr. Morris, did you want to add to that same topic? I could take you out of order sure. if, if you're following on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what he said. I, I mean, I just sort of saw a disc disconnect when I, you know, when I read the review, which, I mean, which was thoughtful and wonderful and assertive, but not aggressive, but it addressed a lot of substantive concerns ab about the systematic review. And I mean, I was reading this and I th was thinking if I was writing this as a review of a manuscript for a paper, I would check the reject box, not the accept pending revisions. And so that's the disconnect, you know, that I think Dr. Sam had also expressed experience. I mean, these are significant problems that really can't be fixed. So, you know, I mean, some statements about how they're still redeeming value and we can proceed or whatever, but expressing the concerns that these really are significant problems. I, I sort of view this as aiding in clarity. I, I just saw this as a discon disconnect between the verbiage and the recommendations. Thanks, Dr. Morris. Uh, 
I think we'll probably return to this topic, but let's hear from the others who have their hands up. Dr. Hernandez Ruiz and then Dr. Bruder. Um, yes. Uh, so thank you. And and I just wanted to elaborate on the on the question right before we went on to the break. Um, now you can see me. Um, so I did read the documents, very in, uh, extensive, um, 400 pages each. I did find myself lots of times and, and coming back and rereading sections. I don't have um, anything to add again to the scientific documentation that was provided in there. A lot of it is outside of the scope of my expertise, which is epidemiology. But going back to um, the health um, advisory level and the fact that we are working on the MCL, I'm wondering if it is possible to have in the review, what are the current capabilities of most laboratories to accurately um, measure the levels of the compounds in question, because I'm afraid that we are going to end up again at a place with an MCL that is not going to be um, visibly uh, implemented um, due to technology challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bruder, and then maybe we could see if Dr. Chu wants to say anything now, that would, that would also be fine. Go ahead, Dr. Bruder. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the, the process of systematic reviews and the steps and the protocols, et cetera. Um, I, I guess I was left, I, I mean, I had the same reaction. If your foundation is not a comprehensive review of the literature with clear inclusion exclusion criteria, um, you're, you're kind of, you're not pursuing a systematic review. I mean, you're, you're, you've already made some judgments that the reader does not know about. I guess that left me sort of wondering where in the process are we? I know there's a target of, of you know, putting out a rule in the fall, proposing a rule in the fall, um, but that's dependent on, you know, I think on, a bit on this review. And so I don't know where in the process this all leaves everything. And I guess I'd like some comments on that because one of the things I suggested was, well, at least publish the protocols as they stand so people know exactly how things were included, excluded, what things were searched, what weren't, that kind of thing. So I guess I'll, I'll um, uh, just stop there. Yeah, I mean, we, we can certainly ask that kind of a question and, and that question can be answered, you know, the what exactly was included and excluded and more about how um, that was approached. There's sort of a bigger underlying question here. Um, you know, we've been asked to look at these documents. We have a panel that's done a tremendous amount of careful work making suggestions and recommendations uh, related to those documents and, and what was done pointing out um, places where, you know, there's missing references, there's um, pro lack of protocol in some cases, other things. So I think it gets back to where do we take this? Um, you know, we've been asked to look at these documents, we're giving information about that, we're asking questions pointedly in some cases. Uh, you know, that that is, that is what we've undertaken. Dr. Chu, I did say if you wanted to insert something here, you can, and then we'll keep on taking comments, but. Uh... Yeah, so in terms of a suggestion for the, um, the broader issue that, that John mentioned, I mean, I think that's up to the chartered SAB in terms of whether the letter should include a statement like that. I think in the body of the report, because it's not really, it's beyond kind of the charge of the review of these particular documents. I'm not sure that that it's necessarily appropriate there, but as a you know an overarching um, issue to be raised to the administrator, you know that if that seems appropriate, then you know I think the, at the at this the, this committee's level, that's something for us, us to decide. Yeah, I agree, and I mean charge questions are deliberately kind of prescriptive and trying to focus us on certain things, but if we see other overarching issues, I think we certainly should not look away from those. Let's see. So thank you. So Dr. Guckenheimer, go ahead. So um, in the, the comments that I submitted, <clears throat> I have a feeling that, that um, I didn't find a kind of overarching review uh, 
a sense that I got lost in the details, both in the panel report and when I tried to look at the EPA um, draft documents that, that are being reviewed. It seems that the, the goal here is, is to reset uh, contaminant levels for PFAS, PFOS and that we're on a path to reduce them drastically from the current levels. I didn't find the, the, the sort of clear cut or the, the concise statements of why this is being done and what the seminal studies are that suggest that this is an appropriate action to take. <clears throat> Furthermore, in conjunction with uh, issues like what levels can we measure, um, it seems that when the EPA deals with regulations, that economic uh, cost benefit analysis is always something that needs to be taken into to consideration. And I don't see any indication of that, that here. So I would like to, to, to see, um, not necessarily in these documents, but somewhere else, a really good statement that can be disseminated to the public of why there is such concern about PFAS and PFAS at this point. I Can I just ask I, you, Dr. Greg Hammer, are you referring to um, what you see in the four documents that we were reviewing or in the quality review report? Uh, sort of both. Hmm. I mean, the, 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 our review is focused very much upon procedural matters and the protocols for, for doing literature reviews, for example. And the, the issue of what are the, the, act, the, the, what is the actual state of affairs in terms of how confident we are in uh, assessing the health risks associated with PFAS, PFOS is something that just doesn't come through to me. Okay, and I'll call Dr. Post, but I, I also was wondering, you said um, that economics and a consideration of benefit and cost, if it would, if in the quality review report in particular, which is why I asked which documents you were referring to, we would be focusing on the scientific and technical underpinnings of the EPA documents. And so to the extent that scientific studies are included or excluded because of the approach to the literature review and so forth, that's very much about what science then underpins what's being done and, and what uh, technical information underpins what's being done. And we would not necessarily be looking at other factors that the agency has to fold in in, in everything that it does. Um, but if it were sort of, they had taken a particular approach to benefit cost, and now we were looking at the technical and scientific underpinnings of that, then, then that would be called out. So, I, so that's why I was trying to make a distinction between well, what you so were seeing in the quality review, if that was what your comment was about, or if it was about what was in the four documents. It, it, it's really about the extent to which we can quantify mm -hmm. the health risks that are associated with PFAS and PFOS. Okay, thanks. Dr. Post. So I'm a member of the PFAS review panel, so I'm not commenting on the report, but is it okay if I provide some clarifying information in response to something Dr. Guckenheimer said? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. One of your questions was why about the numbers have been reduced so drastically from the previous levels and what, what was behind that, and that didn't, I think you said it wasn't like clearly stated or it didn't jump out. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the other numbers and most of the state's numbers and most numbers, health-based numbers for these chemicals from EPA and everyone else most previously were based on animal data and these numbers are based, these new values are based on human data and a number based on human data is going to be much, much lower because the exposures at which, to which even with the uncertainty factors being different. That's a lot of what's the major change 
the jump from using it based on animal toxicology data to human epidemiology data. In the earlier EPA documents, in the 2016 health advisory documents and the supporting documentation, it said that they couldn't relate human exposure blood levels to internal dose and that was why they didn't use human data and now there are models that EPA's accepted for doing that and approaches and that's a lot somewhere in I know that SAB panel reports really long but it what I know in there it does say that this is a major change in that EPA should one of the recommendations maybe not in the cover letter but it says somewhere in the report that EPA should explain the basis and the rationale why very clearly why they now feel human data can be used. So that's why the numbers are a main reason they're so much lower. Does that help with your question? Yeah. Well, that I think that should be up front. We can put that in the letter to the administrator okay. as, yeah, to really highlight it and perhaps also move it up higher in the report. It is, a, I mean, 150 page report. It's a great report. It has all kinds of things in it. So yeah, getting that organized and prioritized is really important. Dr. Olmsted. Thanks so much. Um, so I, I was a member of the review committee too. I'm just, I'm sympathetic to some of the comments that have just been made about wanting a bigger, you know, somewhat of a bigger picture and thinking more carefully through benefits and costs. Mm -hmm. What I would say is um, right, the committee is responding to the charge questions from the EPA and the work that the EPA has shared with us. Um, it, and that's a rich set of work and a sort of rich set of charge questions, but it's definitely not comprehensive. And so, you know, we had some comments that Dr. as Dr. Chu mentioned about, you know, the particular endpoints that were chosen, you know, um, you know, we were asked to, for example, review the cardiovascular um, risk model. Um, and sort of ask, well, are there other endpoints? And as the EPA has said, you know, both, uh, you know, kind of in an initial, initial meeting and also, um, you know, Mr. Bernison today in his slide presentation, there are these other pieces of what will become the benefit cost analysis for the sort of MCLG determination, you know, for the regulatory impact analysis for that piece, which is required right under the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, in addition to being required by executive order. But, um, but that, that complete, you know, kind of benefit cost analysis is was not, you know, at least to our knowledge, you know, as, as far as the committee goes, is not complete. And we weren't asked to review that. We were just, you know, kind of asked to comment on these specific pieces. So it may be that some of what you're looking for, right, in terms of comprehensiveness is coming down the pike. And um, and and I look forward to seeing some of those things too. Thanks. Yeah, just it a, is helpful to hear from the panel. Go ahead, Dr. Chu. Yeah, just a quick follow up on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the panel was a bit frustrated that some pieces were missing. And we were told specifically that some pieces were missing. For instance, the mechanistic data was missing from the documents. And EPA told us that it was missing because it wasn't finished. But, you know, they wanted to get the review going. Um, so, but, you know, we can review what we haven't seen. Um, and the same with the other, the benefits analysis for the other endpoints. You know, I think the, the panel would have been delighted to see the analysis, the, the analysis that would go into, you know, benefits analysis for whether it's a low birth weight or for, um, you know, immune response. Um, but, you know, we weren't, we, that wasn't provided to us. So it's kind of, we only have a piece of the elephant that we're reviewing, um, but we can't, you know, but ideally we would have wanted to see the whole thing, but, um, the other thing okay. I want to well, on that, just on that point quickly, I think it is fair for us to itemize and sort of um, lay out what pieces are missing, <laughs> you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, for the record and just mm -hmm. for, for this, you, you mm -hmm. had a chance to discuss this. You did come up with what these areas were, you know, your panel is well aware. And I think that highlighting that is a, is a fine function. Um, you know, as you say, you can't review what you don't have, but you can say, look, these are the pieces that we would really have liked to have had, and they, they would be important uh, potentially. And right. yeah, I, I think that's fine. So adding that seems great. And you do have that information. So I appreciate that. Go ahead on your next point. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, I think the other one was that we, we did try to, in response to kind of, again, John and, and um, I guess John and John. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we did... Uh, maybe in some places we, as someone said, we, we maybe we're too tactful. Um, but for instance, the suggestion to focus on four endpoints rather than you know every single endpoint under the sun, 
Um, and you know, we did have a suggestion as well to apply the similar meta-analysis approach as was done for the CVD document uh, to consider that. Um, so we were looking for some recommendations to help, uh, you know, to the extent they need to do a lot of these things over to at least do over a smaller part of it that might be more manageable um, than to try to redo everything. Um, but I, and maybe that's something that could be again highlighted in the letter uh, as well a little bit more. Yeah, that's great. I was wondering, uh, Will King, are you able to pull up John Samet's comments, especially the very final part where he had suggested for the board's consideration an additional statement that we could make in the letter to the administrator? It might be helpful for people to have that in front of them. I know there were lots of yeah, documents. The title of the document. Uh, well, so this is in the um, this is in the comments from board members. That's not the title of the document, though. That's the content of what it was. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's page thirteen. Thank you. We can take a minute to to get that um, yeah, in front of folks. Or it might be faster if you have it. You could share your screen. Well, so I'm looking at it in my email. Well, actually, okay. I can do it a different way. Hold on. I think I can do this. All of the review comments on PFAS draft report as of 7 17 22 highlights. Here, I'll, I can share my screen. Uh, I didn't want to share. Here, let me do it this way. All right. Hopefully, you can see the SAMIC comments and nothing but the SAMIC comments. I have so many things open. Uh, so, these are the comments, and, and he did review, but down here, um, I recommend that consideration be given to an overarching recommendation on how the sweeping methodological concerns described in the report should be addressed. So this is sort of trying to pull it all together. The comments make clear that EPA's approach to gathering, synthesizing, integrating, and applying evidence are lacking and not the state of the practice. Unfortunately, serious flaws are documented with all aspects of the systematic review and evidence integration steps, including not having a protocol, uncertain approaches to assessing evidence quality, inadequate narratives for and weight of evidence determinations around causation. Systematic review approaches are now being applied to gathering mechanistic and toxicological data, but were apparently not utilized by EPA. Report points to approaches that have been developed within the agency for systematic review and externally. Uh, I don't have to read it word for word, but various programs, you all have this. This is in the quality review comments document. Um, various programs in the agency, uh, as John mentioned, developed for other systematic reviews for Irish, for Tosca, for um, ISA, committees of the academies and others. Steps have been taken to approve processes. Okay, so getting to the punchline here, given the well-documented problems with the reviews and the documents, does there not need to be an overarching recommendation that they need to be redone following state of practice for systematic review and evidence integration? There is in the letter to the administrator, the draft letter, um, this paragraph that we recognize time constraints for completing the rulemaking and is supportive and so forth, but should there be an additional sentence such as, however, the SAB considers these supporting documents to have methodological flaws that could undermine the rulemaking process and urges that these problems be addressed with revisions that represent state of the practice for gathering and using evidence for decision-making. So this would be an additional sort of statement or sentence. Um, I think Dr. She said something about tactful. I think someone earlier said assertive, but not aggressive. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing there, but adding a, that sort of a statement to kind of tie it all together and really acknowledge what it is we've put forward in the pieces that are being called out sort of individually in response to charge questions. And John, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. John Morris, go ahead. Everyone's called John today. Go ahead. <laughs> it's the John problem. Actually, yeah. I think that sentence by Dr. Summit is great. And just putting something like that in the cover letter would address my concerns because it highlights that this is a significant issue. I agree very much. And I, I also think that the administrator would want to hear this because those methodological concerns point to legal vulnerabilities for them. Thanks. Uh, let's see, Dr. Post, you've got your hand up. I think, that, oh, I think Dr. Morris, in your comments, you said also something to, con if, it, if we agree, it, just to consider the idea that something to the effect of despite all the problems, 
the panel agreed with the overall conclusions of there was a sentence like that in your comments could could that be if could we also consider whether that's if we want to include that along with what dr samet suggested or you don't think that's a good idea anymore or dr morris did you want to give a little recap on what that sentence was well i, I was just dealing with what i what i thought was this inconsistency between the devastating review and then no comment at all in the recommendations. You know, I didn't, I didn't read the, the full EPA report, so I don't really, I put that idea out there, some statement that the report still has redeeming value despite these serious limitations. If the committee thinks that's true, the review committee, then I wouldn't have a problem with putting it in there. Um, I don't really have an answer to that question. It, it's just that there's- well, Yeah, for the for specifically, we explicitly said for the likely carcinogen for PFOA that we agreed with the conclusion, um, but we thought that it needed a better, you know, narr weight of evidence narrative, and et cetera. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, we, and then we also said that, you know, it appeared to the committee that the four endpoints of liver, uh, immune, um, low birth weight and uh, cardiovascular or the, the cholesterol, serum cholesterol, had the strongest evidence. We, it, as you know, not put it in a category, but those had the, uh, amongst the endpoints, the ones with the, the most uh, evidence um, that would support a, a causal relationship. So, mm -hmm. and to prioritize those. Um, so we, we, we didn't step in to say that we think that those are causal endpoints, but we said that those had the strongest evidence of the endpoints that were there. So I think we're trying to, to you know, walk the fence there, not prescribing that those that you know, without having done a systematic review, we somehow came up with those conclusions. Um, but that you know, they should prioritize maybe those those four endpoints. I, I guess what I what I sense is if if we put Dr. Samet's sentence in the cover letter, then mm. let's not add a sentence that, despite the shortcomings, we agree because that's sort of contradictory. Let's just go with the cover letter sentence and leave it be. Yeah, I think that was the, the question that we were all hoping you would weigh in on, so thank you. It, you know, I think we are focused on the science and the technical underpinnings. We do raise very carefully, thoroughly, you know, a lot of these issues. Then if we make that sort of summarizing statement um, and, and try to draw a conclusion and pull it all together, I think that's super helpful. Dr. Post, you had your hand up. Oh, I, I took it down. Okay, you took it down. Other comments about the quality review, about the content of the letter to the administrator, um, how to best present and package this, this incredible information that this review has really uncovered and, and try to pull that together. Other thoughts? Dr. Le Chevalier. Well, I heard the comments here about addressing the regulatory process, the setting of the MCLG and ultimately the MCL. Um, and I just come back to the SAB panel, particularly reviewers. Do we think that the, that the issues that we brought up uh, in this analysis um, should mean that the um, health advisory levels um, be redone, withdrawn. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think, think the comment before that like, if I was reviewing a paper and I found these deficiencies, I would mark the reject level. And, and while a lot of the comments focus on the future and the regulatory process, um, is, are, are these such that the, you know, we don't have confidence in the, in the um, health advisory levels that have already been um, issued, and, and should those be, um, you know, well, EPA already said they're interim and they will revise them, but you know, are they a, such a level now that we, we don't think that they're, well, helpful? Um, uh, so I'd like to hear the reviewers, you know, a, a thoughts on that, on specifically, um, you know, what this analysis means as far as our confidence in the health advisory levels. Thank you. 
Thanks. And I would just let, let's hear from the viewers. I would just also encourage that we think about the the basis, right? The science and the technical technical basis that um, underpins that. And as far as what policy decisions and other things, that's where we wouldn't necessarily weigh in. So Dr. Chu or other panel members, I think it's fine if the other panel members are in, um, chiming in here too. I certainly yeah, never I, intended that not to be. I don't have any, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, we obviously didn't discuss the health advisories because they just came out last month. Um, so, I mean, I think many of the panelists recognize the urgency of, of this issue and the need for, you know, this sort of comprehensive review um, and the need for an actual MCL and not just a health advisory. Um, so I think, you know, we were, you know, we were torn between the, the urgency and then, but also all the scientific issues that we identified. Thanks. Let's see, the order I have on my screen is Dr. Bruder, Dr. Post, Dr. Olmsted. If someone wanted to follow very closely on what Dr. Chu just said, I would certainly let you jump the queue, but I think you're all on the same topic at this point. Yeah, I guess that my my question is is a bit procedural, and you know, or not necessarily procedural, but are the concerns sufficient that we also add that we actually want to see a revision? And this would be a revision to. Well, they're going to, they're modifying their lit review. A comment mm -hmm. was made, will this mm -hmm. change the, will this change the um, concentrations, that kind of thing, if you add in other literature? I'm just curious. Yeah, I that's think I recall that. Yeah. Sorry, you think you recall? Say it again. Um, I, I, I believe I, earlier in a previous appointment, there were instances where that happened and we did you know, go through it again. I, I can't remember, you know, there was, I, I can't recall the weight of the urgency for the issue. So that has to be balanced here, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Post. Um, my comment's a little bit different than what Dr. Roeder just said, a different angle. So more in response to what Dr. Le Chevalier was asking about the numbers and revising. I've been thinking about this a lot because it impacts what we do in New Jersey too. Basically, EPA has stated that, and today they stated it in, in other webinars on it, the, rep, the reference dose or the non-cancer number will change, but they anticipate that they're considering the comments from the, essay, the draft SAB report, it will remain below the reporting level of four. So in effect, unless the reporting level changes, which isn't gonna happen, like it takes. So in practical effect, it's if it's detectable, it exceeds. But just as from the science, human health effects point of view, as I said before, the big change was from animal using animal data and to human data and all of the four effects that Dr. Chu mentioned that we concluded are have the most support and should all be considered low birth weight, decreased birth weight, excuse me, increased serum lipids, increased liver enzymes and um, decreased immune response. The studies are all from general pop they have all been observed within the general population exposure range. So any any reference dose based on the, those studies, whichever is chosen or if several are chosen and, you know, weighted together, it's going to be very low. If it, it's really the human data and the studies from the general population range. So the actual number could change, but it's still going to be far below the reporting level. So as far as like that any and and that's the direction EPA stated they're going in as well and I conclude the same thing based on my review of which of that which it's my area so and that's it thank you Dr. Neptune yeah um I I, my, my concerns um, actually kind of 
reside with the whole idea of calling a analysis a systematic review when it's not a systematic review. So if that is actually, if that term is actually used in the foundational report, then, then that in itself is a, is a huge problem. Because I, I think we all recognize that a systematic review is a compromise. It's a compromise in the setting of not having adequate data from individual studies and a lack of power in individual studies such that this kind of compilation provides some kind of legitimacy from kind of an evidentiary posture. But if you're not performing a systematic review in the setting of all of those challenges, then you lose all of the kind of scientific legitimacy of that particular methodology. I say that because if the Dr. Samet's kind of um, points are legitimate, then we have to ask for a systematic review following the typical protocols and the typical approach. And I don't know if that's feasible within the time frame that one would want in order for the rule to be advanced within the time frame that EPA would like. And so I don't, I don't think anyone has commented on just the feasibility of addressing that particular problem, which, which I think is really huge. I mean, it, 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 it kind of addresses the first part of the report, but that's such an important consequential part of the report that I, I don't think it's something that you can kind of set aside or make accommodations for. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Samet, I think you're next up on my screen. Well, maybe just in part in response to Enid's comment. I mean, I, the pace at which things can get redone could be incredibly slow. And I'll, I'll use the example of the IRIS formaldehyde assessment, which I chaired the review of, I think we released our report in 2011. And for those of you who are IRIS aficionados, the revised report after some delays for whatever reasons uh, is coming back to the National Academies for review about 10 years later. So these things, if redone, and you know, particularly by the agency, I think we all know it would take a long time. I, I think going back to Enid's point, and the points made by others, uh, if if there's a need to use these documents soon as the basis for rulemaking, the question does then become: What are flaws that have to be acknowledged because they can't be fixed, like a systematic review that's not really a systematic review, or you know, and what is it that can be fixed that might be um, really important, you know, perhaps tuning up a dose response analysis or something else. Now, you know, the way the charge questions worked, the committee was, you know, did an admirable job of sorting all this out. It wasn't asked to say sort of what you can change with, you know, a quick fix or, or not. And again, on any of these, it almost depends on how deeply you want to probe into uh, what, remedies might be brought to make the document um, better. So I, I, you know, if there's an immediate time frame, I think we, we certainly need to sort of provide the warning that the document is not the state of um, practice, which I think was, you know, even down to whether, you know, it meets the definition of what a systematic review um, is. Um, so I, I think that's sort of the burden on, uh, on us. Yeah, and we could certainly add, um, you know, something explicit that this is not to be considered a systematic review or, or you know, to call out that uh, discrepancy. Uh, Dr. Post, I think I might have missed you before. Sorry, I think you had your hand up and then Dr. Guckenheimer and then uh, Dr. Weintraub. If you miss me, but Wei Shui, I, you probably remember this better than me, but in the panel meetings, didn't EPA acknowledge that they knew they didn't follow certain aspects of systematic I think a lot of some parts were like consistent with systematic review like how each study was evaluated in Hawk but other parts was acknowledged that it really wasn't a formal systematic review do you I don't remember the details but maybe could you if you do could you clarify it for everyone yeah I'm trying to remember exactly how they phrased it but I think different parts were for farmed out to different teams I think and so that was part of why we saw some inconsistency of language in terms of what they meant by like moderate or suggestive or things like that. 
Um, and so this, so, you know, because that was one of the things that we noted that some, a lot of the, you know, the heavy terms were not used consistently um, for the, the descriptors. Um, I mean, I guess, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily our place to, to do prioritization of what the agency, you know, has or has not resources to do or their timeline, but, you know, I, I think that, and, and, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know sort of what the kind of minimal requirements for the rulemaking are in terms of like, what is the, what is the bar that needs to be met in order to, um, you know, to propose an MCLG? Um, to what extent is MCLG needed to declare an MCL, right? So, I mean, all these different subtleties, you know, just, you know, kind of, you know, thinking out loud, if you, if you just looked at the PFOA carcinogenicity and said it was likely, you could set the MCLG to zero based on that, and you wouldn't need to worry about any other endpoints because the MCLG is already zero. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing the cost-benefit analysis, then you you know you could use the cancer as as the basis of that. Um, but if you wanted to include other endpoints, then you would have to go back and do you know either a meta regression or a meta analysis of the beta coefficients to look at what the slope of the um, PFOA versus you know serum cholesterol level is. So you know there's there's various ways to kind of not necessarily do the full Cadillac, but um, get what's needed for the rulemaking. But you know that's kind of uh, I didn't we didn't feel like that that was it was our place to make specific recommendations as to how they should go about threading that needle given the state of these documents. Thank you. And I don't know if Tom Brennan wants to weigh in at all on, you know, we've been asked to review these four documents. We now have this review. There'll also be these proposed and, um, you know, the, the regulatory steps of the rulemaking where we also um, have a chance to weigh in. I'm not saying we shouldn't put everything that we now know and, and have seen and would like to raise in the information we have now. We certainly should. But I'm just... Uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to say something more about process uh, and timeline. Uh, no, you were right about that. So you have this opportunity here right now before you, and you should take you know, full advantage to support the agency and do the science review. Uh, it, when they follow up and do the rulemaking process, then the SAB may have another opportunity to look at again. Um, in my mind, I, I kind of feel like if the, the peer review is done here, unless something was, um, if, if the peer review is done here, then, then the rule is based on the science. You know, that's kind of my mindset. But I guess we'll know it when we see it for sure. So you will get a chance to uh, have the opportunity if you needed to. To see what was then changed and what shows up in the proposed rule when we do the screening of proposed rules. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. A lot of people have their hands up. Dr. Guckenheimer, Weintraub, Chen, Anoro, and uh, Hernandez Ruiz. That's the order I have. <coughs> so for, for me, the, the principal question here is whether the report that we're reviewing is the sole basis <coughs> or the primary basis for establishing the health advisories <laughs> Excuse me, I've been setting the, the uh, levels <coughs> by the EPA. <coughs> Using the analogy with um, <coughs> IPCC documents, <coughs> if we think that there's medium or high confidence, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> In the evidence for setting the <coughs> advisory levels, we should do it. <coughs> That's it. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Dr. Weintraub, <coughs> Anoro, and Hernandez Ruiz. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to chime in um, on this discussion. I. I was reflecting on the main comments that I was making um, in my as the lead reviewer 
about the organization of that section as far as the panel's report. And um, I think in the end, what I was trying to get at was a concern that we, the, the SAB panel re peer review of this was um, focusing a little bit on this hypothetical, you should have done it this way. And this is this is the way we think you should have done it. And it's and and pointing out not so much pointing out necessarily what was wrong with the way they did do it. Um, and there's it's a important distinction, I think, because I think what we would like to do, what I would support us doing is um, the idea here is to give EPA feedback so that they can revise their materials appropriately um, so that they are better, right? And I, um, I think telling them to go back and just, you know, do it all a different way is, um, is a legitimate thing request to make, but given the timing of it, it is not likely to serve the rulemaking, the current rulemaking process. Um, and as such, I think going back to, sorry, I forgot um, who made the analogy of if we were deciding to accept or reject the manuscript, in this case, um, you know, I think we can frame our um, our, our response to EPA about, um, about the quality of their report, um, so, of their documents by saying, you know, these are the criticisms, please respond to them and please respond to them in some very specific ways, just as we would um, when reviewing a document for publication. So are the flaws, you know, going to change? Can you assess whether the flaws that we've identified would change the, um, you know, the ultimate body of evidence and, and results that have been presented in these documents? And if so, how would it change them? Would it make us wish we, um, you know, would we assume that there should be a higher level or a lower level of, I mean, ultimately that hasn't been the actual level and decisions haven't been decided yet. Um, so I just, um, I would like to, um, uh, having just done this for the CCL and understood a little bit what the, um, the ultimate process can be, um, I, I would like to encourage us to be um, to figure out a way to give feedback to EPA so that they can revise the report, then bring it back for an additional review, probably by the whole panel. Um, with the CCL, we, we agreed that it would just come back to the lead reviewers. Um, but I think in this case, uh, what I'm hearing anyway is that it, it would... Um, come back to the whole panel and then and then see. I mean, that's the whole point is that we want them to make it better and um, more defensible. Um, and and then that also helps it stand, it helps everything stand by itself because the, um, you know, the acknowledged flaws are, uh, are, are addressed head on. And then we can say, you know, yes, and continue working to do this better next time. So you're saying they would bring back the documents after revision to the panel, and then that would come back to the entire SAB in a separate step. Is that what you're the road you're going down? That's what I'm thinking, um, just based on the the. Uh, I, I mean, I think ultimately those two different paths, the one that you, that that I described that you just redescribed versus the one that we decided on for CCL five, um, they're probably not that substantively different um, from each other because I think um, no matter what panel members are invited to, um, you know, to, to 
um, to provide input um, if they have something important to add, I guess. Um, so yeah, I guess more than anything, the point I'm trying to make is that I would like us to, um, to with, with the understanding that practically speaking, um, it, it's not gonna be possible for a full redo in the time that is available in which these documents need to be used um, to give the opportunity to EPA to, um, to, to have some clear um, criteria that we would like them to to respond to so they can um, you know tighten up the report and have it be uh, or the documents and have them be useful. We, yeah, we're definitely giving them our you know our feedback and and all that itemized information. You had said that this might not end up looking very different from the CCL. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, although it could unfold in a very different way and structurally and timeline wise and other ways that could make it look really different from that. I see that Tom Brennan has his hand up. I know there That's are others great. waiting patiently. Yeah. Thank Tom, you, you might want to respond just on this yeah. one. Yeah, I, I, just to review in my mind what the purpose of the quality review is. The purpose of the quality review is to for the SAB, the chartered SAB, to review the work of the panel. And, you know, when I heard Jean's comment, it almost sounded like um, the concept was to re-review what the agency had brought to the panel. And I think what we're looking for here is that we're reviewing what the panel did. And that um, I think that realistically speaking, this should be thought of as the opportunity to give the agency feedback. And, um, you know, the, the SAB and, and the work of the panel um, stands alone as important, critical uh, peer review feedback. And um, the agency uh, recognizes the importance of our work and the role that we play, and they'll, uh, they'll do their best to make the suggested changes that we recommend, or at least to think about them. Um, some changes that we recommend as a SAB panel and you know, as a board get put into play and, and others uh, do not. Um, and the agency uh, will um, have to, you know, deal with the, with the fact that we've given these peer review comments and handle them as best they can in the time frame that they have before them. So I just kind of wanted to put, just sort of re-clarify the purpose of, of what this is. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, this review, you know, they requested this review from us. So it would be kind of interesting if we then turn that around and say, and now we're asking you all for another round, you know, it, it's different when, when we call for a review. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to call on the others that have been so patient. Uh, Dr. Chen. I, I'll, I'll just, oh, sorry. I think Go ahead, June. I, I do think that you've understood where I was going. I, I was jumping into a different process, but I, I do fully understand that the, that we're not, we're not going to actually ask EPA to turn things around um, and let us look at it again. But I want us, I was suggesting that we act like that, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And at other points in the process, we could be looking at some of these same elements again. So I, I don't want to preclude that. When, yeah, if we're rule, we, we'll have the, the board has an opportunity to look at proposed rules as they go through and if, um, mm -hmm. and could take advantage of that opportunity if it was appropriate to, to review that. Just as a way, a little bit of history, um, several years ago, um, we as a board did the connectivity of uh, wetlands and streams in the United States as a science document, and then went on to review the waters of the US bill that came out, and that was in the in sort of the mid 2000s. So there, there is some history of, of looking at both the rule and, and the regulation as it were. And we've looked at multiple rules that followed from that initial connectivity report. Correct. Uh, let's see, why don't we, this is super helpful, Tom. Uh, Dr. Chen, Anuraro, Hernandez Ruiz, Borsuk, and Elian are all waiting. Go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, actually, um, I sit on the panel. Um, um, certainly, I, I know the, the EPA report is, say, let's say, systematic review may not be perfect, but um, 
they were built uh, actually uh, that you know to offer certain organ systems of the P of the PFAS literature. It's quite extensive in terms of review. It did not include all the literature before 2016, so that is potential limitation. And it did not include some of the peripheral papers that's published actually after they submit. And there are some other papers not included. But then when we're looking at the, uh, the key papers on the key outcomes we actually use to derive the, the MCLG. So the liver enzyme, the both weight, the, uh, the antibody response to the vaccination. And, uh, it's, and it, it's kind of like comprehensive to capture the key papers, I would say this way. So let's see, you know, if we want to do a re-review or adding new evidence, are we going to really change the science or the calculation of those response given the, you know, the couple of new, new years of data would come out? I know the both weight has been you know, done by the 20, 30 studies already and serum, serum cholesterol levels have been done at least more than 10, 15 studies. So if you think, you know, what we really can add given if we want to ask EPA to do like a re-review or just supplement all this new data. So what would come up, come up actually as the next step? I doubt we would actually make any changes in terms of derivation of the MCLG levels given the paper. Certainly I'm not saying in five years later it could be like totally different in terms of calculation, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's my sense given you know, what I'm reading in terms of like the science part or actually the literature on PFAS. I'll stop here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Florence, go ahead. Yes, um, I guess uh, everyone has kind of covered the scientific and the um, procedural nuances that we're talking about. But I'm also thinking that as we give our recommendations, we also have to um, remember that typically when these advisories are given, it's the other way around. They start at high, pending when further um, scientific information comes in. And in terms of human um, health and effects, normally down the line, we find that something was they said to be safer or safe actually was highly toxic. And for me, the way I'm looking at it, they are taking a very, at least with the evidence we that's presented so far, they're taking a very important precautionary approach uh, with the levels. And then what we can, the recommendation that if evidence shows additional evidence and the systematic review that with and everybody's talking about comes up and proves otherwise, then they that can be changed. But I'm thinking that we should always focus on that rather than all of the other uh, nuances because we're still looking at the, the, the human impact and, and the, the, the health effects of all of these, uh, uh, the PFAS and all the other um, compounds that have been uh, you know, shown there in the, in the review. And that's, that's what I'm thinking, that we don't lose sight of that um, and make sure that we um, highlight it as, as um, saying kudos for doing that. Because I think for me, it was very, very important that this very you know precautionary approach was taken, um, even though all of the scientific data that might have supported that is not there, but initial data still um, is, is the right way to go. And then our recommendations would be, how can we improve it, but don't change these advisory levels now until further evidence is, um, is brought up. I Thank appreciate, you. yeah, I appreciate this comment. I. Um... You know, we are weighing in on the the science and on the technical side of it, and we have a lot to say about that. And um, and then it's definitely an EPA's court to make those policy decisions, those regulatory trade off decisions, and, and the balancing and so forth. So that's that's you know their their bailiwick, and that's where um, we put our information and our our comments into you know our comments on the science. Uh, appreciate that. So Dr. Hernandez Reese, and then Borsuk, and then uh, Alien. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Dr. Cullen. Um, totally understand that the purpose of, of this um, uh, board is to review the science that, that goes into you know, this review, this analysis. Um, it affects the science in terms of measuring concentration in water, right? So all of these studies that have been done in control settings, um, 
uh, they're dosing these compounds at known concentrations that are much, much higher than what we see in water. And so we're extrapolating basically what are those responses, right? What are the, the health effects of, of these doses uh, if somebody was to ingest water? And so I think that there's that disconnect and, and it has led to mistrust from the general public, right? How can the EPA issue an advisory level that you, the scientists, are telling me that you can measure? So the public doesn't understand whether the scientists are a scientific, you know, science advisory board looking at uh, those um, studies compared to actually measuring what's in water. So I understand that our role is not to get into the policy making process, but I do believe that um, that the administrator needs to be informed at least of what are the current capabilities. Because again, you know, if we issue something that we can measure based on extrapolation of scientific studies. Um, that puts us in a, in a very bad place as a scientific community. And then changing the advisory levels or taking them back um, really doesn't help for that trust to be built and maintained from the public. And so I do like, I would like to stress um, the importance that scientifically speaking, uh, we are not there to measure these concentrations. And, you know, just to maybe perhaps make a comment, um, about where we are as a scientific community um, might be important. That's just my, my personal belief. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Borsak, you Yeah, my comment had to do with um, prioritization. Um, I appreciated that the, um, the panel prioritized what needed to be done, um, but I felt like maybe they went a little bit too far in um, trying to um, guess at what the EPA may or may not be able to do within the time frame that they have. So I would suggest maybe, and maybe this is a question somewhat in response or for, for Tom um, based on some of the comments he made, but it would seem to me that we shouldn't be trying to say what they do or don't have time for. Then it's a matter of, you know, in some sense, it's a matter of who they put to the task, um, but rather um, prioritizing them so that if they have limited resources, they could see what might be most important from a, from a scientific perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I, I think Tom said something similar earlier. Um, you know, they, they will take all this under advisement and, uh, and do what they can with it. And they have been, I think, extremely open to, you know, asking for this review and providing documents. We would have liked to have had more. We have a lot to say about what they did give us, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, I, you know, being able to prioritize that is important. And I, and I feel like the panel did a nice job with that. So thank you. Dr. Alien and then Dr. Post. I just wanted to um, say in some ways, uh, I hope that the uh, quality review comments of individuals is really read by the individuals at EPA who are working really directly with this issue. I know my comments were really related or focused a little bit more on where I thought there were omissions or things that could really be improved on the EPA side. Um, but with that said, and there were sort of five specific areas that I felt really that other people have brought up in this discussion. So maybe some of my earlier comments as a lead reviewer were really part of this discussion, but it gave me an opportunity to put those in there where they could be read actually as a, in a document. But I think that when it comes down to it, the document from the panel could in some ways maybe be a little more forceful in some of these specific areas that have been discussed during this um, discussion. But in down, uh, as Tom Brennan and others have said, in some ways, it's really, of course, EPA that will read these and then decide where, where to go and what's most helpful. And, but I think that um, in the letter to the administrator, having a general uh, suggestion, which um, Dr. Cullen, you sort of read some verbiage or uh, what, and you've heard from others, it is appropriate. And But getting down to some of those details that we've been discussing or uh, expecting you know, EPA to react in some way to, to this for our benefit um, may, may not be appropriate. So I just want to sort of put, put it full circuit again, a little bit more general again, in terms of what the charge is of the committee and how we can sort of address that in the documents that will be um, transmitted to EPA. Yeah, really appreciate that. And uh, Eric Bernison did say, you know, they were already reading the individual comments as well as having you know the benefit of looking at the 
the draft report on the quality review and so forth. So yeah, I think we should we should have some confidence that they are looking carefully at that. And I appreciate all the individuals who I know it was a big ask to go through all this and submit individual comments. And some people, it's their specialty, others it's not. Although sometimes when it's not your specialty, you see different things that are also useful to EPA. So that's um, that's been great. Really appreciate that. Dr. Post, you're up. I just wanted to clarify a few points about some of the things that Dr. Hernandez released about the doses and how the health effects in the studies. I think you, that Dr. Hernandez really said that they're based on studies at much higher doses and she was concerned we can't measure these levels in water. These chemicals accumulate, it's, but the human, this, this is based on human studies and it's based on the, the exposure is assessed part of the study that is based on the levels of the chemicals in people's blood serum and they bioaccumulate from water to blood or they accumulate in blood. A lot of, most of the studies are based on, we all have them in our blood, even if our drinking water is not contaminated from other sources, food and consumer products and things. And many of the studies that were assessed and that were the key studies are not from where drinking water is contaminated. It's based on accumulation in people in the general population's blood at very, very low exposure doses. It's So it's really, I don't see the relevance of the fact that the health and MCLG or the health advisory is below the reporting level. That's very common for health-based drinking water values in general, even for non-cancer effects in some cases. And at, when you do a risk level and one in a million risk level or something for a cancer effect, it's almost always below. That's We call it the health-based MCL in New Jersey. The APA calls it the MCL goal. It's very common for that to be below the enforceable standard. Even in New Jersey, we do not consider cost benefit based on usually analytical limitations and sometimes treatment removal. All of this is based on human exposure to very, very low concentrations and it accumulating in people's blood. And also the fact that breastfed infants get much hot if the mother is exposed to a certain amount and has a certain amount in the blood, the blood level and exposure in the breastfed infant at peak at a few months of age is like multiple times higher and these effects are relevant to early life exposure. So I just wanted to clarify, these aren't like animal studies that are um, the vast majority of health of, you know, reference doses, health-based MCLs, MCLGs are based on animal studies and usually it is much higher than human exposure and we all accept that, but that isn't the case for these assessments. Sorry for going on so long, but I've spent like quite a few years working on this stuff, so. And we're glad you have and that you're sharing that knowledge with us, so thank you. That's the whole point of this discussion. So I don't see more hands right now. I'd like to kind of take stock of where we are. Uh, we've reviewed, oh, Dr. Hernandez Ruiz, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for that information. And I, and I gather that, you know, from, from reading the reports and, and, you know, I get the main idea, right? And so perhaps um, it could help me um, if I understand the entire process a little bit more. You know, we talked about like the cost benefit analysis and like, pieces, um, you know, important information that perhaps was missing and we don't know what we don't know. So I was wondering if uh, maybe Tom Brennan or um, Dr. Colin can uh, like just give like a big overview, like a roadmap of when these things get taken into account before the MCL is set. I'm hoping uh, Eric Bernison is on the line because he's probably uh, better in touch with how to describe the different parts of it and how it would come together. Eric, I'm yeah, going to send he, that one over to you. He's there. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so, um, boy, uh, so explaining the whole uh, standard setting process uh, quickly. Um, so I, I, I did try to touch on this uh, a little bit at the outset of the presentation, but let me go ahead and see if I can't um, do this uh, with a little more detail. So, you know, the first uh, and a critical step in establishing a national primary drinking water regulation 
uh, is that um, we first make a determination to regulate, which is something that the agency did on this, uh, these contaminants, PFOA and PFOS in March of 2021, where we concluded that uh, PFOA, PFOS uh, may have adverse health effects, uh, that they occur at frequency and levels of public health concern. And then third, that there's a meaningful opportunity for health risk reductions uh, through a national primary drinking water regulation. So we've now triggered that process and we are then now working on a number of actions to support that rulemaking. Uh, the, 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 one of the steps is establishing the health-based maximum contaminant level goal, which is the focus of the, the first two documents that we talked, that the, the SAB is discussing today and a maximum contaminant level goal is set uh, in accordance with the statute at a level at which there are no adverse effects to the health of humans and which uh, considers an adequate margin of safety. I'll also note that the Safe Drinking Water Act lays out some very um, specific requirements about the, the rigor of our health effects analysis, uh, but the standard that's set in the, the Safe Drinking Water Act that we use the best available peer-reviewed science and data collected in accordance with accepted methods. It also talks about the agency considering all of the available scientific information um, it doesn't use the term systematic review, but it certainly requires uh, that the agency look at the available studies to evaluate uh, those that can inform our evaluations. So, um, so that is the that is the base. We have to propose that MCLG, uh, but then we also have to propose a enforceable standard um, and an enforceable standard. Uh, so the MCLG is based entirely on the health effects information. The standard that we uh, must propose. Uh, brings in a number of additional factors uh, for, for maximum contaminant levels. What the statute requires is that we set the MCL as close as is feasible to the MCLG. Uh, the statute is clear that when we consider feasibility, we consider the availability of treatment technologies that have been demonstrated in the field to remove the contaminants, um, which is uh, 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 a key factor and one of the addition, one of the important factors associated with whether or not a treatment technology can remove a contaminant is whether or not we can measure the contaminant to evaluate the efficacy of that treatment technology. So the, the ability to quantify a concentration of a contaminant is an important part of that feasibility analysis in setting the MCL, not the MCLG, the MCL, the enforceable standard. Um, another uh, important component um, in when it comes to analytical measurement is whether or not we can ascertain the level of the contaminant in those conditions where we can't ascertain or it's not technologically or economically feasible to ascertain the level of contaminant. The statute authorizes us to establish a treatment technique, which would be a rule um, like our surface water treatment rules, where we basically specify the technologies that have to be put in place and how they have to be operated. Um, and, and so that's the other mechanism by which we can establish a for, an enforceable standard. Um, the, the statute SIDWA requires us to, to, as we're doing this analysis, as we evaluate all of the, the regulatory options for, uh, for, uh, for a contaminant, the enforceable standards, we must prepare what's called a health risk reduction cost analysis, uh, more conventionally referred to as a uh, economic analysis. Um, and the, the, the document that we've provided to you on cardio, the, uh, the cardiovascular disease is designed to inform one part of that health risk reduction cost analysis, uh, a benefits, uh, benefits associated with avoided cardiovascular disease uh, risk from that. Uh, but the, the health risk reduction cost of analysis includes both quantified uh, and unquantified costs. Costs are typically those costs that are incurred by public water supply systems to monitor and treat for the contaminant, uh, as well as the, the burdens on state uh, and uh, local communities to actually oversee the implementation of a national primary drinking water rule. Benefits are, are primarily, uh, the agency has primarily quantified benefits. The, the, I'm sorry, the, I should say the statute is very clear that the, ag the agency must evaluate both quantified and unquantified benefits associated with, uh, with a particular standard and its alternatives. The most common means by which the agency evaluates benefits is to look at the avoided uh, uh, disease or mortality, uh, mortality and morbidity risks associated with the uh, reduction of the contaminants at various levels. Um, so we consider those, those evaluations at the, at the time we propose, the administrator has to determine if the benefits justify the costs of the proposed standard. 
Um, and then there's additional considerations if the agency concludes that the benefits don't justify the lowest feasible standard that could enable the agency to set a standard at a level at which health risk reduction benefits are maximized at a cost justified by the benefits. Um, so um, uh, there's, a, there's additional analyses about um, uh, the affordability of the technology for small water systems, the availability of, of compliance technologies, uh, BATs for large water systems, um, all of which re represents a very robust evaluation of the standard um, uh, that we present at the time we propose the standard. We lay all that out um, both within the, the preamble accompanying the regulation, uh, the proposed regulation, as well as in the record um, that the agency will make available to the public at the time we take public comment. So I'm going to Stop there, Dr. Cullen. I think there, there's there's lots more detail we could get into, but I I, I think that um, I, I've tried to at least cover this at a somewhat uh, lower altitude than my twenty thousand feet explanation at the start of today's deliberations. Yeah, thanks so much. This gives us all the, that overview and lets us see you know the activity that we're pursuing right now is just in that scientific and technical review of these support documents. There is obviously this huge process, which you did a beautiful job laying out. So I appreciate that very much. Um, and we can also have briefings where uh, if board members have specific things they want to learn more about, we can also have briefings from EPA about some um, sort of overarching topics, which um, if you want to dig into loads of details about some of these things, we can do that. Yeah. So I wanted to... Oh, sorry. Yeah, just one last question, and and thank you so much. That was very helpful, and you know, I I, I do remember a lot of the things that you were saying, but it was uh, beautifully explained. Um, so, is the SAB part of any of that subsequent assessment? The SAB um, looks at the point of the sort of technical information that's being prepared by the agency as requested, and also some other committees of the Senate and so forth um, can also ask us questions. Um, we also, during regulatory steps, we review whether we, you know, there's a working group that reviews whether um, the science and technical underpinning needs needs to be reviewed by the, the full board on any sort of regulatory action that's being taken. So that's at another step. Um, we assign ourselves work. Yeah, we can we can also have a, a briefing about the sort of the role, the various roles of SAB if the, if it's time to revisit some of those. Again, we have a few different functions, and there's a f that's why there's a couple different steps at which we could be reviewing science and technical information related to something like what we're talking about today. Great, thank you. Sure thing. Um, yes, I'd like to kind of bring us back around where, take stock of where we are. So we have a tremendously detailed and thoughtful report from our, from our panel. Um, the board has undertaken with its lead reviewers and then with the full board sort of quality review of that panel report. So appreciate very much the panel and also the lead reviewers and all of you today weighing in. Uh, I don't think we have more comments on those specific aspects of this. This is our review of the science and technical content of those four um, EPA documents. And in particular, we are looking at the quality review that a panel has already, you know, they've looked at those documents on our behalf and they're now bringing on our behalf these comments. We have a really robust, rich set of um, comments to make, and we've had a few more added today, so I think that's very helpful. A, also, the letter to the administrator and prioritizing what we would put at sort of the top level and the sort of header level from that. We've had a few more comments about that, which is also super helpful. So at this point, I would call for a motion related to this activity. Um, it could take a few forms. From what I'm hearing, there's interest in having those changes made uh, to, I'm sorry, there's hands coming up and I'm not sure where, I think we're not at the public comment step yet. Yeah, Allison, I think it's from uh, Mr. Risotto who wants to make public comments after we get through this. this That's step. fine, okay. That's fine, we'll, we'll be getting to that uh, in just a minute. So this, so at this point, I would be um, entertaining a motion about how to, what the disposition of this panel report should be. And we have a few different avenues that we can pursue, um, but from the conversation that we've had, it sounds like we're at the step where there would be some changes to that report, sharpening up a few points, adding some content to the letter to the administrator. We saw some example language of that from Dr. Samet, which was very helpful. Um, all of the comments that people have made today would be considered by the panel and woven into the report. 
the usual place where we make a decision now is whether um, if such a report is then you know updated and edited, would it come back to the full SAB or would we like it to come back to the lead reviewers, which can be augmented by some of the people who had particular comments today, such as Dr. Sama, for example, you know, people who were making those sort of key addition suggestions. Um, so that's sort of where we are now. If there is more. I don't see other hands. So I would then entertain a motion related to the disposition of this report and the extent to which after these changes are made, the full board wants to see it versus just have lead reviewers and the sort of targeted individuals who brought some of those key points um, to be the ones who then would review the next version of it. Does anyone have a motion along either of those paths? This is John. I'll try and I'll I'll try. I'll get the conversation started. Okay. At least. Um, so so first off, I would, if it needs to be in the motion, I would mention that we include the sentence, the draft sentence that I wrote, into the letter to the administrator, uh, and that um, I, I I think there perhaps should be discussion on whether anyone feels that strong enough that there should be additional sentences added to the letter, but at a minimum, I propose that um, that sentence be added where I suggested. And with regard to revisions to the uh, panel's report, I would suggest that those revisions be returned to the re lead reviewers, but not to the full panel. So that, that is, I'll offer that up as a motion. Yeah, that's helpful. And I'll just say, you know, I was not reading down the whole list, but your addition to the to the letter to the administrator, um, a sentence that says what pieces were and were not available for review that the panel wanted was something we had also agreed to put in that letter. And then calling out um, that th the nature of a systematic review and, and, and the nature of what we saw in these documents um, as sort of specific things that would be prioritized in the, in the letter to the administrator. Um, and then there were lots of sort of updating kinds of comments and additional comments for the quality review report self, itself. Self. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks. So that's what I would, when you gave your motion, that's what's in my mind about the letter. Okay. To the right. yeah. No, that's fine. Including okay. all the above. And, yeah. uh, and then, and then also, I mean, I, I, I think given those comments and, and the fact that there's so many individual comments, I think that the lead reviewers could take charge of looking at the revised uh, report. All right, so we That's have a motion. motion. I'll offer up, so. Yeah, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second, John Morris. Thanks, John Morris. Uh, we can open back to discussion, but I think we've basically exhausted all the hands in the room. So I will then call for a vote. All in favor of the motion that this rev revisions go back to the panel and then come back to the lead reviewers. We have specific additions to the letter to the administrator, um, and also a whole very rich, thoughtful suite of individual comments that would be going into the quality review report. All in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, well then on behalf of all of us, the motion carries. I would just again, thank the panel so much for so much work and knowing that we're giving you a little bit more to do now, but uh, I think this will really be a strong set of information for EPA to be able to take under advisement and work with as they move into their next stages. So this is, I think, very helpful. We've, yeah, we've no, done I wanted, a I wanted to thank the rest of the, the charter SAP for their, their input and really you know, refining the points that need to be made. Yes, and thank you so much. Tom Brennan has his hand up. Go ahead, Tom. I, just, I, I don't do this at every meeting, but this is worth uh, a special thanks to the chair and the panel who put this together. It was an extremely high volume of work to, to address. It was a very a diverse set of information to go through. And um, I just want to thank you all for that big effort and a, for a great effort. Thanks, Tom, and thanks all. All right, so we now have time on the agenda to hear clarifying comments um, from EPA and from members of the public. And I have one, I have one name. It's Mr. Stephen Risotto. 
And I will just ask Tom Armitage, have you received any other requests during this meeting? Uh, no, we haven't. Okay. All right, Mr. Risotto, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, Dr. Cullen, members of the board, uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide some additional comments. I am Steve Rosado, representing the American Chemistry Council. Please excuse me just a sec. I think we can all sympathize. Yeah, in sorry our about that. That's uh, quite all right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay. Very much appreciate the board's discussion over the last couple of hours. The earlier comments of EPA staff notwithstanding, the central issue for the board to consider in its review of the PFOA and PFOS documents that are before you is whether the MCL goals described in the documents by EPA are set at levels at which no known or anticipated adverse effects on human health occur, allowing for an adequate margin of safety, per the language of the Safe Drinking Water Act. First and foremost, the studies from the Faroe Islands that are the basis of the proposed goals do not report adverse effects on human health. The evidence for an increase in infection rates among children in the larger epidemiology database, moreover, is conflicting. As a result, the National Toxicology Program concluded that there is low confidence that exposure to either PFOA or PFOS is associated with an increased incidence of infectious disease or a lower ability to respond to infectious disease. Furthermore, the Faroe Island studies also do not indicate that vaccine antibodies were reduced to levels approaching those identified to provide basic immunity by the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. While the 2018 publication by Butts Jorgensen and Grangine suggests that many children had concentrations below the clinically protective level. No children had levels at or below those identified by WHO and CDC. Moreover, the models developed by the researchers and used by EPA are not capable of establishing PFOA and PFOS concentrations at antibody levels considered to be protective. In the case of PFOS, the lowest level of antibody concentration that their model can predict is four to 40 times higher than that which is considered protective. In summary, the Faroe Island studies do not provide evidence of adverse effects on human health, either known or anticipated. Similar criteria should be, should be assessed for the other health points that health endpoints that have been identified. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your comment. I'm looking to see if anyone else, we have no other public commenters. And I don't think we have any EPA commenters at this time. All right, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. So I would like to um, move to our closing. I really wanna thank members for digging in and um, the Chartered SAB has had a lot to do today and you, and you really engaged, which I appreciate. We had a productive meeting. Reviewing the follow-up and sort of next steps I will work with uh, the two chairs, Drs. Weintraub and Chu, to move the CCL5 and PFAS reports forward. We made decisions about how those would be handled uh, at the next step and who they would be reviewed by after revisions are made. Um, we will also implement the board's decisions that we had uh, two days ago regarding EPA's planned regulatory actions that we discussed. And I would now turn to any additional questions from board members about where we are. I want to thank this SAB staff office too for, for helping shepherd us and guide us in our, in our moments when we are at Forks in the Road. So very much wanted to add that to this as well. Don't see any additional questions, but thank you both Tom Armitage and Tom Brennan. And Tom Armitage, I will turn to you as the DFO to conclude the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Allison. I just also want to thank everyone for their work. And with that, I will uh, adjourn today's meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.